Good morning, everybody. Today's episode is brought to you by Black Rifle Coffee. If you go to blackriflecoffee.com right now, what you're going to see front and center is a banner for the Special Operations Warrior Foundation. Directly underneath that, there's a little button that says Learn More. And instead of talking about all the cool stuff that Black Rifle makes, the coffee, the subscriptions, all of that stuff, today, my suggestion for you is to click on that button, learn more about what the Special Operations Warrior Foundation is, and why Black Rifle Coffee would want to support them. And if you can find it in yourself, instead of buying a cup of coffee, or a bag of coffee, or a t-shirt, make a donation. This episode is coming out on Memorial Day, and I can't think of a more fitting way to honor those that have paid the ultimate sacrifice. My guest today is Hazard Lee. He's a U.S. Air Force fighter pilot who was handpicked by the F-35, the most advanced and expensive weapon system in history, which was still in development at the time that he was flying it. While he was on active duty, he became the chief of training systems for the largest training base in the world. He led the development of new technology and teaching methods to train future fighter pilots. He's also an author. His book, The Art of Clear Thinking, just came out last week. It's a stealth fighter pilot's timeless rules for making tough decisions. And I highly recommend it. Episode 287 with Hazard Lee. Enjoy. Okay, I got the red smoke. So you're still active duty? Not active duty. I'm a reservist. So okay. I fly a couple times a month, and then the rest of the time I'm an author. I was going to say, and I saw you have a ridiculous YouTube channel as well, where you're just basically going around flying around in awesome jets. Yeah, we had a good time. We put a, a UFC legend Tito Ortiz in the centrifuge. You know what the centrifuge is? I know what videos of the centrifuge are where people take it a touch too far. Yeah, you got to well, actually. I don't know if they're out. in control. If they- you got to check this out, like <laughs> the centrifuge is terrible. Like it's, uh, it's this like six thousand horsepower machine. They put you on the end of this uh, like gondola and they spin yeah. you around. Nine G's. Yeah, we put <laughs> Tito in it. So Tito, you know, he's a beast. Is this where you practice the hook drill? Yeah, yeah. At some point though, that that is the new. Screensaver on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> he had never been choked out before. So in all of his training, he yeah, had never been put yeah, out. He, I guess he heard that if you uh, if you get choked out once, it's easier the next time. So in his entire career, never fully choked out. I don't think all information should be listened to. I think all information has value, but it's not all valuable in the okay. moment. And I all think, right. Michael, have you ever heard of that? He's already Googled I, it right I actually now. have heard of it. I don't know if it's true. This is where I need my speed dial my wife because she's a jiu-jitsu instructor she has gone out she's watched a lot of people go out i don't know if it makes you more susceptible to going out i don't know either but the point is like you know he's he's a beast yeah he's been doing this for 25 years never choked out you know the centrifuge got him i so. think people confuse it with knockouts yeah i'm because i'm thinking like so if that was the case if you essentially so a centrifuge is driving the blood to your core Correct. Is that what essentially that's what causes add, you to add pass your brain out? into your arms and legs? Okay. So yeah, you can you can pass out if you lose enough blood and and so a choke, it, like a rear naked choke, is just a, an interruption of the the arteries in your neck. Mm-hmm. So I guess a little bit of the same thing. It's a lack of blood flow to the brain. Yeah, I think it's similar. Lack of oxygen. Yeah, but if it was true that if you were to get choked out and be more susceptible, then going into the centrifuge and going out would make you more susceptible to that as well. I think he's retired now, so yeah. he just wanted to send it. No, I'm, what, my long way of saying is I don't think he's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, props to him for hopping in that thing. Minimal training. And, yeah. Uh, we spun him up to nine Gs, so nine times the force of gravity. That's it's like rough. 2,000 pounds of force. Each arm weighs 250 pounds. So what do they take you guys to in training? Because I'm assuming, do all pilots go through that just for that exposure before they get behind the stick of a of They a do. Jet? Like, you'll you'll go through uh, through pilot training, you'll make it all the way through, and then you'll get selected uh, yeah. to fly fighters, and then you'll have to go to the centrifuge. And it sucks, because if you fail once, you get another shot the next day. After that, if you fail, you're out. What's the threshold they're looking for? Nine Gs. Two. Nine Gs for 10 seconds. Oh, daddy. Yeah, it's, it's No brutal. G suit? Uh, you can wear a G suit. Okay. Yeah, you can wear a G suit. Uh, but man, it's it's brutal, and you know the stress is on. Like most of these people, they've wanted yeah. to fly fighters their whole life. 
they made it all the way through. This is the last Man. test, and then people will wash out. So it, it sucks, but uh, and is yeah, that it's just a brutal a, experience when they wash out? Like if you can't handle that nine G's, is that just a physiological issue or not an issue? But and I don't want to say deficiency either because that's such an ex- like how many people are ever going to feel nine G's? Right, almost nobody. They just physiologically can't do it. It's both. It's a lot, a lot of training, and also your uh, your stature. So short, stocky people do pretty well. Long, lanky people, kind of like me, yeah. As have you a say, tough time. you're at the other end of that spectrum. Yeah, so <laughs> it's tough. So I had to, you know, train hard. It's a lot of technique because I mean, Tito's a beast. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, his technique wasn't that great. You can yeah. hear him gas out in it, and then he's he's done after that. So it's a lot of technique, a lot of just being in shape, doing a lot of hit training, yeah. stuff like that. But man, it's it's brutal because one thing you don't realize in there is that you feel like you're tumbling. So as you're accelerating, really? you feel like like you're end over end, mm-hmm. end over end, about once a second. Same thing when you're decelerating. So it's uh, so it's a it's just a crazy, brutal experience that you can't really prepare for. Can we put Michael into the centrifuge? You bet. Where we, is it at? It's in Philly. So we went to the Michael. Only are you in? One. As long as it's paid, let's do it. Oh, I'm covering all the cost, but your threshold is 12 G's. <laughs> <laughs> I asked them if you can go to 10. They, they said they could reprogram it. We actually re- had them reprogram it because it's typically uh, 9 Gs for 10 seconds. Yeah. We had them reprogram it overnight for 9 Gs for 30 seconds. Oh. That, you know, if I'm going to make Tito do it for 10 seconds, I got to push myself. Yeah. Did you do that? I did. How was that? It was terrible. Like yeah. it, it felt like it was like 45 minutes long. I was like, going to say, how long did that monster. feel? This, it's, this darkness is like you, you're losing your vision. It goes down to like you know looking like through a uh, paper towel roll, and you're trying to push this darkness out. And if it gets to zero, you're going to be out just like Tito was. And you know it's kind of funny in the centrifuge, but yeah. in a jet, you're uh, dead. We lost about one pilot <laughs> a year for thirty years to to uh, G lock, G induced loss of consciousness. Michael, we're doing this. Nine Gs. How long can you last? Should we do you versus me? I think you would last way longer we both know that i would without ever being in a centrifuge but how long can you <laughs> oh maybe two seconds okay we need to talk All about right. this we should make this happen i'm I, i'm thinking about doing it making it like a hot ones like interview people while they're you know subject to these g-forces yeah how long does it take that thing to get to nine g's man it's insane like it's like a you know tesla on steroids so six thousand horsepower wow. zero to nine g's in one second how fast could you achieve nine g's in a jet uh Probably it, similar. It depends okay. on on uh, on how fast you're going um, and how low you are. So I would say probably half a second if you really wanted to. Okay, so you could probably exceed the centrifuge, but yeah, you'd have to be can. really cranking on it. Yeah, but the centrifuge, I mean, it just like the the horsepower to be able to go from zero to nine Gs. It's just insane. It has this like this weird futuristic sound. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, it's it's no joke. It doesn't look like a joke. I can't wait to see Michael. Once he goes out, can we keep spinning him for a while? Sure. You can do it. <laughs> uh, all right. So here's, here's uh, we, we filmed this. Por- this is why we went to uh, to 30 seconds for 9 Gs. There's like, there's this viral thing a couple of years back called the euthanasia roller coaster. It was meant to like euthanize people. Like it, it's a concept where you may have Are we a talking about killing people? Killing people. Yeah. In like a humane way? In like, like a humane way. Like an uh, end of life, life choice? Something like that. So it went viral. It's kind of bullshit but um so it was like nine g's for 30 seconds or 45 seconds something like that there it is so that's why we had them reprogram it just to see if uh if someone could survive 30 seconds at nine g's i mean i almost think i don't know where i land on you know if somebody has like super terminal cancer and i kind of watched my mom you know, it, it, she chose hospice over continuing the chemo that she was on because the chemo was going to kill her. It was fucking miserable. I, I feel like people, if they get to that point, should have that option. But as a species, I think we're doing better than a fucking roller coaster. That design looks <laughs> insane. Yeah. Like, can't we think of something? <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous, right? What the fuck? I don't know. Some some uh, German madman came up with that. But uh like, can't we do like a pill or something? My God. Yeah. But this is the intersection, you know, of of that subject plus, you know, fighter pilot stuff. So yeah. we wanted to see if someone could survive 30, 30 seconds at 9 Gs. And Which you did. You did. But I don't think you have a centrifuge uh, or a, uh, a G suit if you're, if you're going to be doing that. So 
Yeah, it's kind of a legal requirement. It would go against the ethics of the death centrifuge to put a G suit on somebody. I feel like that would drag it out a little bit. Or it could be fun, you know. I think I would sign up for it just to see if I can make it. Okay. I can appreciate that headspace. Yeah. Yeah, you're either going to make it or die. I mean, yeah, yeah it's cool. Yeah, let's do it. All right. So you're in the reserves. I still don't understand to this day how reserve time adds up. It's I don't know either. All I know is I'm not getting an active duty retirement. Like so yeah. I, I I had 12 years active duty. So it would have been kind of easy just to stay in, go to 20, but yeah. I wanted to do all this other stuff. I want to do the YouTube stuff. I, well, yeah. I really wanted to be a writer. So it's tough to do both when you're active duty. Yeah, and the government might put some some uh, boundaries on your YouTube as well. Then they will probably be very limited on what you could show active duty wise, at least, which is smart. I get mm -hmm. that. So you, I mean, do you just go back to uh, so you're out in uh, Arizona? Do you just go down to Davis Monthan and I, I? This is what I imagine that there's like at a valet, there's like a little box that opens, and you're just like key, like oh F thirty five today, and you just go grab a set of keys. I wish. I mean, it's it's. I mean, the tr the it's it's a brutal day. Like so, I especially when you're kind of out of it. So I fly a couple times a month, and so whenever it's I tough show to be up, current when you fly a couple yeah, you times have, a you month. Have, I don't know if it was like this in the te SEAL teams, but we have a ton of currencies. Like it's like a Constantly. list of like you're chasing forty five things. <laughs> you're chasing your tail constantly mm -hmm. on being current. So I mean, it, it's difficult even when you're showing up every day. And now I'm showing up a couple times a month. Yeah, and trying to knock all those, all those out. So it's a, it's a long day. Plus How much do you actually briefing. get to fly? The flying, the debriefing, uh, about 45 to 60 times a year. How many hours? Uh, about 1.5 hours each flight. Man. So about That's 90. less than 100 hours. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough. It's Damn. tough to stay current, especially in something that's that, yeah. you know, that competitive, that extreme. And the F-35 is unique in that we're still at the kind of the testing phase of it. I'd say we came out of the testing in 2018, but yeah. still there's a lot of improvements. There's a lot of software upgrades. So it's tough to like be able to stay current and understand how the sub menus are changing, things like that. I was gonna say, do you ever get in there and you look at a button and you think, I think I know what this button does, but I'm gonna push it and find out. <laughs> Not the second part. So you can always, <laughs> you know, that's one thing you can learn. You can always screw something up worse than it currently is. Yeah. But there are some times when I'm like, do I need to? So, so we have. Have you ever flown in one of these jets? I have never flown in those jets, but I got. Uh, Lost track, but I have somewhere between like 3,000 to 3,500 flight hours. Okay. Yeah. So we have the, it's called HOTAS, hands-on throttle and stick. So okay. each, each uh, the stick and the throttle, they both have about 15 different buttons. They can go forward, back, left, How could right. you ever possibly forget what those do? Long push, you know, <laughs> short push. Um, and then four, and then multiple master modes. Yeah. So the master modes completely change all the buttons. Oh my God. So it, it's, it's crazy. Like we call it the piccolo drill, but uh, yeah, there are times when I'm like, is it a long push, short push? Is it a team is left, team is right? Um, so yeah, yeah, it's a little bit tough. That was the, I mean, it's a broad statement to say, but like at a gross level, airplanes are designed to fly the same. If you pull back, things get smaller. If you push forward, they get bigger. Left usually goes left, right goes right. I got uh, typed in a G4 Flying the actual sim and the aircraft itself was not hard. Understanding all of the information that was in front of you, and like you said, the sub menus, you take a couple weeks off, like, fuck, mm -hmm. how do I put that approach in here? <laughs> yep, yeah, yeah, it's, it's tough. Like, it's, uh, yeah. you know, especially when I was coming from, like, the F-16 to the F-35, like, I was an experienced fighter pilot. Yeah. And, uh, you know, our closure rates are a mile every three seconds when we're fighting somebody. That's insane. So it, I was, I was thinking and speaking in uh, F-16, and I have to translate that to F-35. And it was just too slow. It took me about a year to be able to to like really start thinking in F-35. What would you say, so F-16, is that mostly an air-to-air -air platform or air-to-ground as well? Both. So it was designed to be, well, it was originally designed to be just a, a pure dogfighter, and okay. it's evolved into a multi-role fighter. Dogfighter against who? Like, the F-16 is actually an, what was that, like a... 80s or 90s platform? 70s. Really? Yeah, with so was John that Boyd. Okay, Boyd, which I'm so glad you brought that up. It's actually one of my favorite books. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we use the OODA loop inside of the SEAL community, and people would think that we created it. No, not at all. Like, So his book, uh, what is it, Boyd, the Fighter Pilot that mm -hmm. Changed the Art of Warfare? Yeah. I recommend that actually at every leadership uh, talk that I do because of the fact of what the OODA loop, what it is, what it does to people, and how he used to just – Merc people. He did. He, he <laughs> took no prisoners. How did he, he do it? He pissed off a lot of people. Oh fuck yeah! But he dragged the air force with him. Like he he yeah. changed uh, he changed the art of com air combat. Describe, if you could, from somebody who understands air to air, 
what he was doing to people. Because you read the book and you're like, oh yeah, you just won really fast. But like, what does that actually look like? Because he was you mean fucking from he was, his uh, dog fanging building. Yeah, like he was just fucking people up. Yeah, I mean his call sign was like forty <laughs> second void because he would just destroy people flying. Like so, they and would so what start, does that look like? Uh, Did you start off head to head, or how does that go? So we have a couple different types of uh, ways we dogfight. So we have uh, uh, offensive uh, BFM basic fighter maneuvers where we'll start out behind the adversary. So we have a lot of what we call can setups where yeah. we're at precise altitudes, precise uh, aspect ratio. So how the aircraft is looking towards you. And, uh, and we'll start off there to really build the site pictures for new students. So we have a uh, offensive defensive, and then probably the, the best is high aspect where, you, where you're just turning in towards each other, you know, a thousand knots of closure. You're just talking once, nose once you to cross, nose, you know, it's, it's game on. So how would he fuck people up so fast in that scenario? He was just, he was just, a good good fighter pilot like i i've just seen his tapes, them? so i don't really know like yeah. how he specifically was good but uh from what i heard he was great at slowing down the jet he actually like crashed a jet doing it one time <laughs> and you know classic john boyd he uh blamed the air force he said that the jet was not designed well and then came up with some solutions to fix it because like he thought it. he was going to be court-martialed so yeah uh, I think he was just great at being able to slow down the jets, kind of like hitting the brakes, fly right by. Yep. But the thing about that is, you know, if you're an adversary and someone hits the brakes, you're going to do the same thing yourself. So it's not quite the move yeah. that always works that it does in the movie. It works in Top Gun. It does. Both of them. Top. And, uh, <laughs> you know, all, all, all those movies. Uh, so, yeah. 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 He, uh, reading that book was fascinating from somebody who never... I did one of the most beneficial things I ever did. <clears throat> I was a JTAC. One of the jobs that I had was a JTAC, but I did a backseat ride in an F-18. And it was so wildly beneficial to understand the difference in what I can see on the ground versus what pilots can see in the air. And you have a, you immediately recognize, oh, I understand why you can't see the white building. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. In <laughs> like, Korea, we'd say the blue roof building. Yeah. It's like, like, okay, there are 57,000 mm -hmm. of those. Could you be more specific? Yeah. It's even tough, like taking off from, uh, you know, your home city, like being able to recognize landmarks. Now imagine being in, you know, Afghanistan or something like that, like those villages. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, you know, that's, that's one of the key things I did in the F-16 going to Afghanistan, dealing with, uh, with JTACs and, yeah. You know, having that connection is is huge because that's the link to being able to employ air power in close proximity to troops on the ground. So the F-16, I didn't realize it was designed that early. What was it designed against? Russia. So, okay. Or so like Soviet their MiGs? Union. Yeah, their MiGs. Okay. So it was meant just to have uh, heat-seeking missiles on the wingtips and to be able to turn extremely tight. Okay. So they were moving out of the 60s where it was go high and as fast as you can. Um, that was like the F-104 uh, aircraft like that to... The 70s with John Boyd was saying, hey, we need to turn tightly and be able to sustain that turn uh, for a long period of time. Yeah. So that's what the F-16 was designed to do. Um, Boyd would honestly be rolling over in his grave now because we put all kinds of stuff on the jet. So when I was flying in Afghanistan, we were flying with you know, AGR-20s. It's almost like a trash can on the side of the jet. Yeah. Uh, those old 2.75-inch uh, two, two rockets with um, Just laser Just add drag bombs. all over that thing? That. We'd fly with brews with 200, 500-pound uh, bombs. We'd carry uh, two fuel tanks. So there'd be times on the tanker where we'd have to hit afterburner just to stay on the tanker. No way. So, I mean, just because you're were, so heavy? Yeah, these were pigs because um, we'd I mean, put so much stuff on the jet. But you weren't really ha – there was not really an air-to-air -air threat though, right? So I guess you could get away with that in that particular environment? Yeah. But, I mean, F-16 needs that for really any – uh, environment. It only carries 7,000 pounds of fuel internally. And with afterburner, you're burning 50 plus thousand pounds an hour. So Holy that's shit. just minutes of fuel. Whoa. I didn't realize that it was that, that was, I mean, obviously the burn rate impacts that, but yeah, that's not a lot at all. No. So that's like a big so thing. So are they we constantly just sipping off tankers then? Yeah. I mean, we'd have a tanker in Afghanistan just following us around. But really what you do is, uh, which is nice, uh, but yeah, I bet. <laughs> uh, really what you do is you have two external tanks on. Yeah. Those are uh, each five, they each carry uh, two and a half thousand pounds of gas. So okay. 5,000 pounds of fuel. So it starts adding up. Yeah, you're about 13,000 um, so yeah, pounds. So yeah, the F-16 is a stripped down hot rod when it doesn't have anything on it. But when you put all this stuff on it, it starts to be a, a pig, which is why the F-35, it's not really a fair comparison to compare a combat loadout in the F-35 to just a slick down F-16. So what was the F-35 designed against? 
it was designed against uh, really uh, uh, double-digit SAMs, so surface-to-air missile sites, being able to take those out. Like in Top Gun, when you'd see the, you know, when he's doing the canyon run, seeing yeah. all those SAM sites. Which is what you guys do, like, on most missions, right? You're just down there down feet. Down yeah. low, yeah. At like 800 Stealing knots, no big deal. Yeah, yeah, it's easy. <laughs> so, I mean, that was my specialty uh, when I was at Shaw Air Force Base, being a wild weasel and really diving into how do you take out these SAM sites that's, I mean, that's what Ukraine or Russia failed to do in Ukraine. They do not have air superiority because they're, they're just not getting, able to take out these SAM sites. What is limiting their ability to do so? They just don't have the capability? They don't have the capability. They don't have the training. They really think of air power as more of an extension of the troops on the ground, like long range artillery. Yeah. Um, and so, like at, at Shaw, we really dive into how do you defeat the IADs, the integrated air defense? And it's really multi domain. You're talking about cyber, space, yeah. you know, troops on the ground. Everybody coming together, being able to defeat these systems because they're really sophisticated. These double-digit SAM sites, they go, you know, hypersonic speeds. It's really insane because they don't have to worry about uh, weight on the ground. So they can have better radars. They can have bigger missiles. Yeah. Um, you know, it's pretty crazy trying to think of how do you defeat these systems, especially when they're, you know, embedded in a country where they built that infrastructure up for 20 years. Wow. Do the How differently do the F-35 and the F-16 fly? Uh, the F-35, you can feel a lot more buffet on the jet. F-16 was smooth. So really? it was just really smooth. You never felt that buffet, like kind of like when you're close to a stall. Yeah. The F-35, you can go all the way up to the stall. So you're feeling that buffet and then you can go post stall. So we can pull a lot of alpha, a lot of AOA, really skid the jet a lot in the F-35, which is good. It, you know, you can put, uh, weapons, uh, onto an adversary a lot quicker with that. Um, really? Yeah, because you can skid the jet, and then you can employ your weapons. Um, but, I mean, the flight control system is a lot more advanced than the F-35. We can, you know, that, like the first Top Gun where he's in a flat spin out to sea. Yeah. We can do that intentionally. So you can intentionally do that. I don't think I would enjoy that. And have full control over it. What? So you have full control. You're, you know, it's, you, I mean, you can call it up on, on YouTube. It's Michael? A, a pedal turn. And, pedal uh, turn? Yeah, pedal turn. P E D A L. I'm yeah, assuming. Yeah, uh, yeah. Type in F35 pedal turn, and you can see it just just spinning in space. It's fully stalled, so the lift vector is straight down. But I mean, so that's what we can do with these advanced flight control systems now that they didn't have in the Fuck. 1970s. I gotta see this. Are these things two seater by any chance? Single seat only. Can I borrow your flight suit and helmet one day? <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> you can do anything once. No, I mean to like do that, not to do this, but just to fly it. <laughs> I mean, I did fly in the first civilian F-16. So they I have saw that video, for, yeah. For civilians now, so. Yeah, but I feel like you're a little bit more qualified given that you were trained on an F-16. That jet just looks so crazy. Oh, I feel like you need to be so much higher up to be doing this. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, they're... Their airspeed is almost zero right now, and it's just going straight down towards the ground. So you can actually get yourself into quite a bit of trouble because yeah. they're fully stalled. The Is it a throttle on the right and a control stick on the left? Throttle on the left, control stick on the right. Does it move at all, or is it just pressure sensitive? It moves a little bit. Okay. Because, yeah, the, in the 70s when the F-16 came out, it was all pressure. Yeah, and they like found out that fully moving stuff around. No, yeah. no, didn't move at all. Oh, okay. Because they, yeah, they were advancing from like the F four, which it was, you know, like it was all the F eighteen goes all over the place, right? Yeah, yeah it's interesting. Yeah, like, so they they wanted to make it, like, you know, super quick reaction. What they found out was that it caused pilot induced oscillations, so like it just wasn't good with our brain. So they made it move a little bit. Yeah, it was about a quarter of an inch. F thirty five, I think, is about half an inch. I've heard that the new like the six fifties and the eight hundreds on the Gulf Stream, it's uh, control on the left and it's all fly by wire. I don't know if it actually moves, but they move. They went to that. I've never flown a plane that didn't have the, where the controls didn't move. I don't yeah, know if I would dig I, I, it. I don't think I'd like that either. Cause you yeah. kind of at some point want to know like, yeah. you know, where you're at as opposed to like, just give pressure. me a little bit of movement, a little bit. So, I mean, that's, <laughs> I feel like they've already solved this problem because they tried yeah. doing that back in the seventies. Pilots didn't like it. And yeah. they found out that a little bit of movement is good. Okay. What drew you to the uh, the Air Force? Let's talk about what, what got you in and what you did while you were in. Uh, yeah. So when I was five, I went to an air show, and that's that's what kicked off. It was back in the day when you could sit in the cockpit. I don't think you can do that uh, Probably anymore. not. <laughs> um, 
you know, sat in a cockpit, put on a helmet. What was the plane? I was hooked. What was the plane you were sitting uh, you know, in? I was trying to remember. I think it was an F-15 and an F-16. Um, you know, looked like a bobblehead at the time, but got some pictures uh, with that. And after that, I was hooked. It's not a lot you can do as a kid. You know, you have a stream of wanting to fly fighters. You know, yeah. we definitely didn't have money to, like, you know, go and, and fly in Cessnas and things like that. But when I was a teenager, I was able to to get a flight in a Cessna 152, just like a flying lawnmower. Like 99.9% of people did their first flight yeah, on yeah. the controls in one of those planes. I mean, they're myself. still flying from, you know, they're from the 1960s. Like, yeah. Man, I don't know if I'd, I'd trust like my kid flying one of those things. In a traffic pattern, that's about it. I don't know if I'd do a cross country. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like I mean, straight. they can glide pretty well, so you can yeah. probably land on any road out there. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so just uh, flew. Uh, that kind of sealed the deal for me. Then I knew I wanted to, like, go the Air Force route because I didn't want to be on a ship all day. Yeah, um, good call. Which, yeah, turned out to be a good call. My brother's in the Navy flying F-18s, and, man, those guys are just always on the boat. Every six months yep. back on the ship. Um, so turned out to be a good call with that. Uh, figured I'd go to the Air Force Academy, applied for that got rejected um so i thought the dream was done after that because i didn't realize that uh, rotc was an option a few weeks later got a uh, a letter saying if i went to this school called new mexico military institute and kept my grades up they let me in the academy so i kind of went in a, a roundabout way there okay like a almost like a preparatory course yeah it's like a prep school yeah it's in roswell new mexico um okay. and so with the aliens yeah, with aliens. So yeah. a lot going on. I mean, it was actually really cool. They have a huge airport out there. So you, so I, I did a little bit of flying in Cessnas there, and you'd be flying with like B one bombers there in the traffic pattern. So it was pretty pretty cool. Um, but yeah, after that, went to the academy. Didn't do any flying from uh, until I graduated and went on to pilot yeah. training. Colorado Springs, right? Colorado Springs. Yeah. yeah. How was your experience there at the academy? Oh man, it was brutal. Like it was it was not fun. Like uh, you know, I'm glad I I did everything and and uh, no regrets going that way but i think for most people out there probably rtcs the, yeah. the easier way you can have a little bit better uh quality of life and you know my my squadron's like half rtc so it's not like people going to the academy have any sort of leg up did you know going in that you were going to get the pipeline that you wanted or was no when did you f actually find out that you were going to head down the, the path you wanted to go uh, I don't think it was till my junior year. Um, and you commit your sophomore year. So they, they know. They, they get you in. They're like, all right, come on, sign the five-year deal. What were the options you were staring down the barrel at? Uh, what did I put? This is, It's been a long time. Uh, pilot, maybe like – well, I actually was thinking about like wanting to go to combat controller, something like that. Yep. So I wanted to do CCT something route, to, yep. to push myself. So I, I went to Hurlburt for a summer with um, the um, – Special tactics orientation cores were yeah. running around with rocks and oh, stuff like almost that. like on your week. Uh, the it's Navy like guys, summer. Navy yeah. guys called. I think it's the midshipman mm -hmm. tour, something like that. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, I wanted to do something that would push myself, but pilot was obviously pilot was first. One. But you yeah. had to put some other things on. And there. then after that was like acquisition officer or something like that. So I'm, I'm glad that didn't have to do is that. a far stretch from everything that you did. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Glad it worked out. Um, but yeah, I also was a collegiate boxer there. And so so I remember uh, it was after my sophomore year, so I was fully committed. Then they give you the physical. And you know, I'd say 25% of people just don't pass the physical. And it was the day before my physical, and somebody hit me in my right ear, ruptured my eardrum. Boxing? Boxing. And so I had to go through a whole bunch of waivers. It took like six months. Um, I thought I thought the dream was over there. Yeah. But uh, they were able to, it was able to heal. And then I got waivers and I was good to go. Yeah. Okay. So junior year, you find out, you graduate senior year. What's the path look like for Air Force Aviator out of the academy? So first you go to uh, this school called IFT, Introductory to Flight Training. It's in Pueblo, Colorado. You're just flying DA-20s, pr pretty much like modern Cessnas. Okay. And so they just want to make sure you oh, have- Oh, is that a diamond? The, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a good plane, you know, as like, you know, I'd, I'd love to just own one outright, but uh, pretty slow aircraft. And they just want to make sure you have the hands. Like the know, video, once we monetize Michael doing nine G's for five minutes, yeah, we'll be able to buy one. All right. Well, I got, I got a shit's going to trend. Do I, I get I think, a cut of that? No, dude. You're the talent. <laughs> no, that's fair. You're the fucking talent, dude. We're, we have the agent and I'm going to produce. Like, <laughs> I like it. I like where this is going. Um, I don't. So, you uh, don't have a choice in this. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're just you're just talent. You're the dude. monkey. You're just the fucking talent. Um, so yeah, you go there for six weeks. Just make sure you have the hands. Yeah. Surprisingly, about 20 percent of people washed out at the time. 
Um, Interesting. What kind of washout is in they don't like it or they don't meet the test gates? They don't the- meet. They don't meet the uh, the aptitude for it because uh, you know it's it's not like football or something yeah. like that where people have grown up doing it. So people have these dreams of wanting to be pilots and then they show up and they're like, oh, I actually suck at flying. Not everybody is designed to do everything. Right. And it, I don't know why people uh, resist or hesitate saying that. It's just the objective reality of the world. Yeah. We're not all Some created people equal. Good, but, yeah. but the thing about flying is weird is that you don't really have those tests early on. So you go through you know Air Force Academy, you get the pilot slot. Most people haven't done much flying, and then boom, like you're fully committed, yeah. and you realize that you're not that good, or you know, some people don't like it. So yeah, so yeah, about twenty percent of people, you know, uh, washed out there. It's only six weeks, and then from there, you go to uh, to pilot training. So for me, that was Enid, Oklahoma, and you're flying the the T six uh, Texan two. It's almost like a P fifty one Mustang. So turboprop. Uh, yeah, turboprop. Okay. Yeah, about eleven hundred horsepower. It was oh, that's badass. It was awesome. Like that's really where I was like, this is what I love to do because it's almost like sports mixed with academics. Like you, you're just you're learning tactics. Yeah, it's just really clicked because I wasn't a good student and I wasn't a, a great athlete, but this is just where it clicked for me. How was the cockpit layout? Were you on steam gauges or glass? Steam gauges, but uh, they they now have the T6B. So I did a couple of videos um, on that, and uh, it's it's almost like an F35. Like. Fuck. They're upgrading it. They're like hacking the software so you can put SAM sites in there. That's awesome. Um, they're dogfighting it. So there's yeah, heads up display. So it, it is awesome. And that's gonna be the link uh because right now it's just steam gauges. It's yeah. really just good for like it's a tough jump. Hands. It's a tough jump. I did when I got my private pilot license, it was like out in Santee, California. Straight one fifty two, maybe pay a little extra cash, get into like a one eighty, something mm-hmm. they'll really just haul ass, add like five knots. <laughs> yeah. Treat yourself. <laughs> oh, totally. I think I had 50, 60 hours stopped for a long period of time and then got back into it, but went right into a Cirrus. So I had a bunch of time off and then I kind of relearned on the Garmin system. Holy shit. I, that would be a really tough to go from a, a turboprop. I guess you'd be moving at a faster speed, but over the ground, but that steam to glass. Mm-hmm. I mean, you want to talk about information overload. You can just get lost staring at that screen. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's also safer. Like I, it, well, I mean, it had crazy. artificial horizon. It mm-hmm. had like terrain. I'm sitting there. Yeah. And like asking, like I teach me, like, does anybody ever like died not being an instrument rated pilot, just kind of flying around these mountains saying fuck it? Because it was ridiculously accurate. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. That situational awareness. So that's why I don't see, you know, it's, for me, it's not safe. I wouldn't trust any family member to fly like the 1960s Cessna with yeah. all the steam gauges, especially if they're part time pilots. Like, yeah. I don't want, you know, them just going up and flying in a cloud and then, uh, you know, packing it in after that. So yeah. I think, you know, I tell all my friends and family, like, save up a little and fly like a, a Cirrus or something yeah. nice because yeah. the situation awareness is just just much better. I remember I was shooting an approach. You know, San Diego was amazing because May, Gray, June, Gloom, you could just go approaches all day long, punching through the marine layer, and it's fucking beautiful above. But I would, you know, you're flying, it's sitting like, a, like an RNAV or a, even a, actually all the approaches, just looking at the glass, I would I would look up and even the number representation on the runway was accurate. Yeah. It was ridiculous how precise. Again, I'm not going to bet my life on it, but you could almost bet your life on it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. And like once you tie that into augmented reality, which yeah. is coming because I mean, we have that in the F35. Yeah, cuz you can turn your head and see through the skin of the aircraft, right? Through your body. Like it's it's crazy. We don't even have a heads-up display. Everything is just pumped in this helmet and uh What are those cost? Four hundred grand. <laughs> Don't drop it. They're going to garnish your wages for ten years for the rest of your career. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it's insane. Like you're looking out, you see, you know, symbols over all the bad guys, all the information you need to kill them. Three hundred sixty degrees. Yeah, symbols Holy over all the Holy shit. I mean, you can't see three sixty, so you're having to look. Yeah, yeah. Look over your shoulder. But meaning, as you turn your head, you're still yeah. you have that vision. And we have six mid wave IR cameras all over the jet, and it stitches that together. And then, so that's how you see through your body. So it's it's pretty insane. Plus, we have a night vision camera on the that helmet. That is nuts, man. But that's, I mean, that's the future of civilian aviation too. Like it's it's yeah. uh, it's going to be crazy once you tie in those you know Garmin systems to augmented reality glasses. It's going to be a lot safer. <sighs> or people are going to be out there just not fucking paying attention. Yeah, they're going to have so much information. They're going to do nothing. Their brains with it. are just going to be fried. <laughs> well, that's that's interesting. Why? So why do you want to fly? Um. I 
went from an East Coast command to a West Coast command, and they were messing around with getting rid of a winter hell week cycle to see what it would do to attrition. And I, the billet I was filling was as a BUDS instructor. So I checked in, and they're like, hey, we don't have anything for you to do for like four months. So I was driving home, and I it went right under like the short final approach path at the Santee Airport, and there was just this Cessna doing the classics. Dude, it was, I'm like, okay, that guy's going to die. <laughs> But I remember thinking in my head, like, that looks interesting. So I pulled off the road, went to the flight school there, and did, like, the classic. And I'm like, I would like to also try to kill myself on short final, like this person. Did the little flight, and it was interesting. So I took that time to get my private license with no uh, end state or desire to it whatsoever. I just was bored, and I struggled with idle time on my hands. Fast forward a bunch of years, I was working for CrossFit and the founder of CrossFit called me up and he'd remembered we'd had a conversation that I had gotten my uh, pilot's license. He was living out in Prescott, but had a house in Santa Cruz and then in San Diego. So this triangle of death of driving, you know, it's taking him eight to 12 hours to get back and forth. And he said, Hey, like I'm going to buy a plane at some point. So get yourself, you know, get back into the seat and start flying. So I found a Sears training center at Montgomery field, uh, which is right next to Miramar. Heard horror stories of people who confused uh, Miramar for Montgomery mm-hmm. Field all the time and decided that uh, they look nothing alike, by the way, <laughs> but apparently civilians like to land on Miramar from time to time and started flying. So I got current again, then I got my instrument, uh, commercial multi, uh, and then ended up with uh, typewriting in a G4, and then I got my ATP when I got my 525S uh, typewriter. Oh, man, so you're, you're fully committed. You're all the way. I'm not current anymore, but I have all the licenses yeah. somewhere. I got my FAA card somewhere. Nice. You know, yeah. it, it was awesome. Yeah. And uh, the Gulfstream was an interesting experience. And then, you know, the Citation series, the single pilot rating on that, that's pretty wild as well. You're up there throwing all the shit. <laughs> You're by yourself flying those? <laughs> yeah, I got my uh, I got my type rating. So the 525S. That's pretty cool. You can fly solo in those. Yeah, it's the lar- I think it's it bounces, it starts bouncing up against the weight requirement. Um, I think a CJ4 plus is about as big as you can go single pilot. Okay. Most people don't fly it single pilot, but you can you can get that S on your type rating. Nice. Yeah. I mean, that's that's all I'm used to. So, I, you know, yeah. I'm sure people can do that. So, I mean, it's It's, it's not nice to bad. be able to sleep, you know, and have somebody else over there and say, mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Eat your meal, the trays built into the Airbuses. Yeah, it probably is. Yeah. Yeah. I think it is. Like, so they, they'll have their meals. They'll pull it out, you know, over the stick or over the yoke. But here's the thing. Do you think being an Airbus pilot is actually exciting no not at all i feel I, like, I have tons of friends that do it I, no. I feel like by their company policy they're probably on autopilot at 500 feet on takeoff or, or earlier mm-hmm. and probably not turning it off until they get to that on the landing so you're really like you're managing systems absolutely and you're not even doing a whole lot of that either you're just yeah. you're just uh just chilling there i don't know if i would like that i mean it'd be cool that you get to you'd spend some time in different parts of the world but for me that is not same. Fun flying. Same. I mean, if we yeah. were in the 1970s or something, like yeah. I'd probably be an airline pilot right now because I, you know, that was that was the the golden era for that. Yeah. But now, tons of fighter pilot friends that fly for the airlines. They'll all say the pay is good, benefits are fantastic, but that it's not fun. Once in a while, they'll see a good sunrise. Yeah. That's it. And you know they're up there just like I could barrel roll this fucking. Thing. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> split ass. <laughs> yeah. I think somebody actually did barrel roll a, a 707 back in the day. Uh. You know that movie Flight, where the plane inverted and they yeah, lived? Yeah, the Denzel movie. Well, that was based off of an accident that actually happened in the L.A. area. Let's just say the outcome was not what it was in the movie. Mm. But what's crazy is the audio. I've, I've found it once before. The audio exists of the other pilots talking about, other aircraft talking about what they see. And you hear somebody like click on, like, that airplane is upside down. And then it went straight it in, at, like, I think, like 800 knots. Yeah. So, obviously... Zero people survive, but that's where the, I believe the inception for that movie came from or the idea. It's been a while since I saw it, but I did remember they were flying upside down for a while. So yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of weird stuff in there that even as a non airline pilot, you know, they turn the engines off. And then one time the guy's like, you know, firewall it. I'm like, but you've turned them off. Yeah. So- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I There's, mean, movies clearly yeah. not realistic. Speaking of, what are your thoughts on uh, the Maverick series one and two? Top Gun? Yeah. I mean, they're classic, iconic movies. The flying. Half my friends The are, flying, uh, I mean, though. Like, what are your thoughts on the oh, flying sequences? Ridiculous. Yeah. Terrible. Good movies. Yes. Great uh, storyline, all of that, but terrible in terms of tactics. They'd all get shot down. 
Yeah, what, yeah, what do they get wrong in that? I also feel like you don't go head to head four feet from each other either. Like yeah. sp- spitting, splitting a flight yeah, of two. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> With a thousand knots uh, of closure there. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's completely ridiculous. Uh, you could tell they built the script and then gave it to some fighter pilots. So the, the comm is actually pretty good, like dead eye, yeah. where your targeting pod's not working. Those little things are right. Uh, the medium and big things are completely off. So you wouldn't yeah. send like a four ship of F-18s to go take out this, you know, huge, uh, huge system. Why would you not just cruise missile that fucking thing? Yeah, you can use cruise missiles. But I mean, if it's a, a hardened target, yeah. you know, cruise missiles can have a tough time with that. So you probably do need an aircraft. But F-18 is not the uh, the the key aircraft. So they needed that because Tom Cruise only wanted to fly uh, F-18s. F-18s. He's kind of... He's kind F-35 of the thirty-five big... single seat. I was gonna say he's kind of the big deal in the movie world, so he's probably gonna get what he wants on that. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah. So it's not gonna be F eighteens. You have to be stealth. So stealth yeah. is really the key to key to the show. Now you have to be stealth. If you're not stealth, you're gonna get shot down. So if they had done it more realistically, and obviously don't give away anything about stealth technology, but would they have even had to have flown at that low level, or could they just have relied on the super small reflective pattern of the aircraft and flown at a normal altitude. So we've tr- really transitioned to more of a medium altitude air force now. So you really don't have to fly as low anymore. Yeah. So that's to defeat the radars. But even then, probably the biggest thing that they get wrong and people get wrong is it's not this 1v1 cage match of sending up you know their best fighter, your best fighter. It's like hundreds of assets all going in, multi-domain, space, cyber, sea, everything working together trying to defeat the adversary adversary is doing the same thing they're extremely smart um you know they're just sitting around thinking about how to break your kill chain so it's really this you know it's more of like a football analogy versus a a cage match analogy that people think of it as um so we'd have to take out all those those sam sites the surface air missile sites yeah um you know so you're looking at hundreds of aircraft going in there taking all those out i guess you know the the cruise missile strike early on was was reasonably you know, accurate, but you'd have a lot more assets in there. Yeah. So you'd be hitting the airfield and also just destroying that surf to air capability on the way in. Just destroying everything. It's the yeah. shock and awe thing that you, you know, have seen the last couple of wars. Like you need, a, you need a lot of aircraft going in and, and destroying all those key nodes. So, I mean, that's what you see Russia fail to do with Ukraine. And so now they're kind of stuck in a slug fest. Yeah. You really want to go in, disable all those key nodes, kill their infrastructure and be able to establish air superiority. Well, that's a fucking boring movie. I think it'd be exciting. I mean, that's what we do. But, uh, you know, that's electronic warfare. Tom you know, Cruise doesn't like get a sign on for that shit. I know. I hear he's working on uh, going into space next. I had heard he is trying to do a movie sequence in space as well. Mm-hmm. I forget where I heard that from. It was somebody who was kind of in the know, though. But I also thought and had heard he was trying to be the first. But I think a Russian already accomplished that. With a movie? Yes. Went yeah. to the ISS to shoot just uh, like a cinematic movie all somebody right. else i think did it all right well i guess it doesn't count because we don't know about it so. yeah what uh so how about the dog fighting sequence in the in maverick how was that from a flight perspective uh kind of the same thing like hit the brakes fly right by clearly if you're the other jet you're gonna hit the brakes as well wouldn't the brakes be bringing the throttle backwards yeah. as well because he jammed it forward and then pulled back on the control stick yeah, yeah i don't think that's, that's, that's the, the wrong, wrong thing so yeah <laughs> idle speed brakes uh you know aoa override yeah and pulling full aft so we'll call that a stack um for a tree where you're you're flying almost highway speeds and you're just rocketing in the vertical you're trying to slow down as much as possible so that would be a lot more realistic instead of just hitting the brakes flying right by you know, fit gen fighters, especially uh, Russian fighters, they are extremely maneuverable. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's probably taking it to the extreme, what you saw in Maverick. But if you see some of those air shows, like, it's pretty insane. What it they is can wild do. what they can do. I think my favorite, honestly, the sequence in that movie, it, and it wasn't super exciting. I love seeing the F-18 flying right over the desert. That, that yeah. to me, I was like, that's fucking badass. Well, they did it. You know? I know. That's, and you can tell, cool. too. I like, I'm like, like that's at, awesome. Like 20 feet. Like, yeah. that's, that is insane. How uh, many waivers did they have to get for that? Uh, <laughs> it's Navy. I think they just do whatever they want. I don't know. Air Force were really restrictive. I just got qualified down to 300 feet. So typically it's 500. Yeah. You can go down to 300. But I mean, that's that altitude. You just sneeze and oh, you're, you're going to go into something. So I don't feel like the Navy just lets their pilots go that low. Probably I not that feel low. like there were some conversations had behind closed doors. 
Because that thing was probably, I mean, it had to have been under 50 feet. Yeah. I guess, I mean, when you're taken off, you can stay low. So like not for that long, I don't think he was nowhere near a runway. <laughs> yeah, if you're if you're near, so I mean, I just got into this because we we flew at the uh, the SoCal Air Show, so mm-hmm. I, I got a chance to do that a couple of weeks ago, or was it? It's about a week and a half ago. And so we there are tons of rules and regulations, and we had to kind of pick through that. And you know, if it's an airfield and not just like somebody's barbecue, like you can do really anything at an airfield, including you know staying low, yeah, and staying in afterburner. So. I mean, we, we had to get like general level approval to do some of the stuff we did, which is just regular stuff wow. we do at the airfield. So, yeah. All right. So uh, after the turboprop, when did you strap into a jet for the first time? Uh, with the uh, – so you fly the uh, the T6, then you move on to the T38. Okay. So six months in the T6. Is that a double-seater? Double, both are double-seaters. Okay. So both um, are uh, trainer aircraft. So we started with 30 people in my flight. Seven people got selected for the T-38. Um, and so that's that's a 1950s era jet. That's the hardest aircraft I've flown in my entire career. Really? And that's killed the most people. That's why they split. So back in the day, huh. everybody went to the T-38. But it's it's super underpowered. They wanted to go supersonic, and uh, the engines are very underpowered. So they had to make it look like a like a dart. So it's like a flying dart. Pull this thing up, Michael. I want to see what this looks like. T-38, you said? T-38. Okay. Yep. Underpowered, uh, very aerodynamic at high speed. Uh, doesn't have any of the like active flight controls that we have in the F thirty five. F thirty five's wing is completely changing as we're moving through different flight oh, wow. This is just old oh, you school. see this. This is actually was like the airplane they were using in the first Top Gun as like the aggressor aircraft. It almost yeah, looks like. like what was it the Mig Mig twenty eight? Yeah, something like that. <clears throat> wow, yeah. that thing does look crazy. Yeah, what about that is killing pilots? So those wings are tiny and they don't have like active flight controls or uh, active flight control surfaces. So the F-35, the leading edge will move. Yeah. So it'll increase the camber so you yep. can fly slower. This- See that on a lot of commercial supersonic. airliners too. Yeah. But this is 1950s technology. That wing doesn't move. Um, and so high speed, pretty good handling. Low okay. speed, terrible handling. So a lot of people would get in traffic pattern stalls and just kill themselves. Oh, fuck. So then I don't know when they changed. I think in the- I guess in the 90s, they split. So most of the class, anybody going to heavies, like tankers, transport aircraft, they would go and fly the T-1. It's like a business jet. Pull that shit up, Mike. I want to see that too. Yeah. they. I think they're retiring in the next couple of years. For those trainer aircraft, are the is the rear cockpit set up the same as the front? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So you're, can, you can talk about what everybody's seeing and they can kind of coach you and teach yeah, you through Yeah, I don't it. think it's like identical, but it's, it's, it's pretty full up. Oh, this is interesting. Yeah, that's like a small PJ, like a private jet. Yeah, but they're actually retiring that. They, they, so the Air Force is in a pilot <laughs> shortage crisis. They're trying to push as many people through as possible right now. And so what they're realizing is that airlines are being able to train people in simulators. Yeah. So they're getting rid of the T1 and just putting people straight to simulators in their actual airframe because they're like saying- a level D sim. Yeah, it's not really- translating from the t1 from the t1 to like a c17 so why not put somebody in a c17 sim spend more time there and have them fly as a co-pilot longer my only well my first experience with it was the Gulfstream, which was my first ever turbine time and i mean you you realize because of the graphics like hey i'm not in an actual aircraft but the to get that certification i think it was level d whatever it is like all the buttons are in the right place. They all function. It had a heads up display that you could flip down and look through. And then you get you go to do your first flight. And it's crazy to think too that you can get qualified and licensed to fly a Gulfstream having never actually been in a Gulfstream. And then it's like, okay, let's uh run the sim. This button kind of turns it on. Let's start the APU yeah. up. <laughs> well, I mean, same thing in the F thirty five. Yeah. Like first time you're flying, you're you're flying on your own. And you have to land that thing on your own. Fuck. But the Sims we have are incredible. Like, yeah. They're insane. They're like two stories tall. Multi-axis. Like, well, not that because they found that you can't really replicate, you know, flying fighters without that. does make without sense. That. Although the centrifuge actually has a uh, flight sim mode where they can do that. Really? Because they have like a hydraulic um, lift on the gondola. So it typically spins you out. So yeah. it, can, uh, it can adjust so you can get some lateral G-forces. So that's the only thing. If you're mm. in a centrifuge... You can have a good uh, fighter, uh, fighter, uh, you know, multi-axis moving sim. But outside of that, we don't use any any movement. But so I mean, they're F-35, insane. F thirty five, you learned mm-hmm. how to fly in a sim. Yeah, it makes total sense though. 
Yeah, I mean, it's only single seat, so yeah. you learn how to fly. So you go through a couple months of academics, a couple months of simulator training, and then after that, your first flight is on your own. So I'm, I'm an instructor, so we'll follow these new students around. So I'll be in an F-35 following them, <laughs> um, which is great. Like, <laughs> as a fighter pilot, you don't want to be stuffed in the back seat of, like, an F-16 or something. As Not a unless flying. your ejection seat is guaranteed to work. <laughs> yeah. Even then, I don't want to break my back. Totally. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, yeah, we'll follow them around. They do a great job. Simulators are great. Like these sims, they they're full, you know, 100% real cockpits, yeah. and they'll they'll uh, you're on this like tank track, so you, you hop in the sim, and then it wheels you into the middle of this like giant two story dome, and it's like HD, Whoa. and they're all interlinked. Uh, so I mean, it's 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 pretty crazy. Where's that at? So we have them at Luke Air Force Base in in Phoenix. They're multiple when places. When can I fly one of those? They do declassify it every once in a while. So All right. I'm just saying. Hit, I'll, I'll hit you up right. next time they're declassifying it. And then we'll go over and knock Michael out. It'll be a perfect video series. Yeah, we, yeah, we, have, we have some good content here. I like it. <laughs> wow. Okay, so um, you're in your jet trainer, and then how long are you in that before you switch over to – well, actually, when do they tell you it's going to be F-16s? Uh, so you're there at six months, and then they, they make it dramatic, so it's the last day they drop all the, the stuff. So it's – so, so day one, when you show up, like the wing commander came in, gave kind of like a pep talk. It was like, all right, close your eyes. How many of you want to fly fighters? Raise your hand. I rose my hand. Open your eyes. Everybody's hand yeah, was raised. That was going to be my guess. He was like, all right, <laughs> two of you guys are going to fly fighters. The rest are going to fly heavies. I want you to think about that while you're here and walked out. I was like, oh, that's some pep talk. Um, so it was game on after that. Uh, you know, and it's a weird dynamic because, you know, you, you, you're there to help your your friends, your teammates, yeah. and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, you know that You're only also competing. Two, two or three people are getting fighters. Did he tell you the truth about that, or does he say that in every class, and then maybe there are more than two that are going to get fighters? Yeah, it, so it, it, it changes. So uh, anywhere between like one – I think every class got one fighter at least. So anywhere between one and like four at the okay. time. So, so it just depends. Very few, though, in very comparison few. to the, the total number in the classroom. Yeah. All right. Yep. So uh, the very last day is when they when they announce what you get. So everybody's like sweating bullets up to the end because seven people go on to fly T-38s and then out of there, two, three people get fighters. And, uh, you know, everybody in T-38s is pretty good. We had like airline pilots that were in the class who were just crushing everybody the first half. Yeah. Um, but then they started having some issues with like formation flying and, and things like that. But uh, yeah, T-38 very tough to fly we'd even fly in the back seat for instrument rides which mm -hmm. was brutal there's no autopilot in it it's all hand flying they'd have like drapes that went up over the back seat um so yeah six months of flying that you announce uh you know that you know i got selected to fly the f-16 mm -hmm. then you go to this other school called uh iff introduction to fighter fundamentals and it's kind of the last stage of all right this guy probably has the hands and the aptitude to do it but does he have the the attitude like does he have the uh is he coachable they pretty much just like push you to to fail rides you know they're gonna what are you flying there t-38s but you're flying them in a tactical way up to up to there you're flying you know instrument formation you're not really doing anything tactical if iff is is where you really start to do uh dog fighting really starting to do air to ground stuff as well how many hours do you have at that point for the average person Assuming you came in with zero, because I'm sure there's people who, people who come in with yeah. a ton. If you were to come in clean, how many hours do you think you'd have at that point? Maybe about 200. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, you're still pretty pretty green. Pretty you're still figuring out flying. Nobody is good at, at flying at first. Yeah. Like, every student, you know, that's a lot of people come up and they're like, you know, they want to act like they're Maverick throughout that whole thing. Maverick would, would have never made it through pilot training because everybody sucks as a student pilot. So, yeah. you really have to have, like, a good attitude. It's probably the same thing. Being a being a seal, yeah, it's actually it's a course that in many ways selects for character through a physical means. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, as with all selection pipelines, it's not perfect. Yeah, so. yeah, same thing. Um, but yeah, IFF is that last stage of this guy is a good pilot, but we're gonna poke and prod him. We're gonna have him hook some ride, fail some rides. We're gonna see like just to see how they react. Is he an asshole? Yeah, and uh, and actually at the time they were washing about twenty percent of people out of there. So, um, what would happen to them if they did get washed out? They would go fly heavies. Okay. So they're yeah, not going to get so, ejected from the Air yeah, Force in general, no. just a different pipeline. Yeah. The Air Force is like, this is, this is a good asset. Let's, yeah. let's use them somewhere else. Same thing with Centrifuge. They go fly heavies. Okay. Um, so at some point, though, 
they tell you you're going to go F-16. Yeah. Yep. So that, I mean, that was, that was, uh, outside my son being born, that's probably the best, best day of my life. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, yeah, went to uh, Luke Air Force Base, flying the F-16. That's, that was the dream from the beginning. So getting a chance to do an afterburner takeoff, like <laughs> max AB, uh, I mean, it, okay. So this is, this is a pretty funny story. So, uh, first flight, we do a max afterburner takeoff. There's the a first flight. Yeah. He, you might as well get after it. Let's, let's do it. Get to nine G's. <laughs> like the instructor is cool. He's like, all right, we're going to afterburner takeoff. We're going to get to nine G's. We're going to do all the fun stuff. He's in back at this point. He's in the back front. seat. Yeah. And so afterburner takeoff, I mean, you can feel each of the five stages lighting off. Like you're, it just pushing you against the back of the seat. You're just accelerating faster than, than you ever have. These were you're uh, flying this or he's flying. I'm this? flying this. Fuck yes. So I mean, I'm this, so this here was for the this. dream. Yeah, oh, it was awesome. And yeah, you can feel each of those five stages. Boom, 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 lighting off, accelerating you down the runway. At about uh, 150 knots, you pull back on the stick. The thing you have to worry about is overspeeding the gear at 300 knots. So <laughs> right, you know, right away. Yeah. Uh, uh, bring the gear up and the weather was pretty bad this day so it's in arizona we get a lot of uh like monsoons and things like oh, that yeah, you do. so so the weather was pretty poor there's like thunderstorms around we go right into a thunderstorm and uh there's a bunch of hail in there so we're just <laughs> like hitting all the, the canopy it breaks the aim nine uh sidewinder no nose. way it like sandblasts the thing so like five minutes in the flight we're now an emergency aircraft We've sandblasted the jet. Um, you know, the AIM-9 is, is jacked up, so we have to get a chase ship. We have to land it. Um, so it's just this big thing. We, there's a safety investigation afterwards. But uh, it, was, it was, you know, the you know, hey, man, best just, 10 minutes of my life. I was going to say, get it out of the way on, you yeah. know, hop number one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so that yeah, that was that was flight number one. But, uh, man, I was like, I don't need to do anything for the rest of my life. I've, I've achieved my goal. So. How much uh, classroom before you got into an F-16 cockpit? It's about two months. Okay. I've just but it's co current. So okay. so you do two months, about two months of sim training. That gets you just flying. Yeah. And then after that you're doing a mix of academics, sims for like tactical stuff. Because after that you move into BFM dogfighting. Then you move into medium range air to air, long range air to air, and then uh the second half of the class is uh air to surface. When do they put you in a single seat? I think it's only four flights in. So Wow. Yeah, four flights in you're you're soloing. But How was that the first time? Oh, Just awesome. you and an F-16. Just do, 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 do. Yeah, yeah. Well, because up to that point, you you know, you know, get used to like not saying anything, not talking to yourself because there's somebody in the back seat. You yeah. know, you don't want to say like, you know, like, God this damn, this doing? is cool. Yeah. So like, so yeah, you, you can just talk to yourself. You can say, you know, so it's, 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 it's awesome. I mean, to, for me, soloing, the first time ever, even a Cessna was just like a big deal. Like it changed my mindset. It's like, I took this thing off. I have to land this thing oh, yeah. on my own. So I don't know if it was like that for you. I always felt like I forgot to do something. <laughs> like, let me get that checklist out one more time. I've done everything on here, but somehow I feel like I'm going to remember something that I forgot the second the wheels get off the ground. Yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> that's how I felt for the first half of my career. There's something I'm forgetting. God damn it. What it's like hacking. It? Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was like the ultimate solo. It's like, I can do whatever I want with this F-16, especially because yep. the first one, I don't think you're going out with a flight lead. The first one, I was doing some advanced handling or something. So it's basically like, here, take the keys, go have fun. So you're like fucking off in an F-16. You know, they call it advanced handling. But I yeah. like I like it. Yeah. I don't care what they call it as doing long as that's what you music. were doing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's that's just, it's an incredible feeling. That's amazing. Yeah. So, yeah, after that, you're, you know, you're, you're, uh, you're flying solo probably every second or third flight. They've had to, uh, the D models are the two-seater ones. They've mm -hmm. had some wing spar issues and uh, some laundron issues. So, they're getting old. So, I think they're changing up the syllabus to be more... Uh, single seat only for the F-16 pilots. And I mean, we've proven it in the F-35 that you can do the entire syllabus solo if have, if you need to. Yeah. How, uh, at some point, obviously you, you finished training because like you said, you were flying for 12 years. How long into it before you did your, oh, actually, what year was this that you were going through? This was 2011. Okay, so what, well post 9-11. When mm -hmm. and how long until you were sent downrange on an operational deployment? It was a while. So it was 2016. Okay. Because I went after after uh, graduating from uh, the B course, as we call it, I went to Korea. So, you know, we were doing some missions there, but there's no, you know, no combat missions there, obviously. So I was there for two years. 
Um, and you know, the thing is, even after you make it through the B course, you're still worthless. Like the biggest asset you are to the squadron is being a snacko and s- stock in the snack bar. Okay. So you still have to go through like upgrades. Uh, I think it's about three months of mission qualification training. And then after that, you can just be a wingman. You can just follow your flight lead around. Um, do that for a while. After a few years, you can become a flight lead mm. in charge of four aircraft. I moved to Shaw Air Force Base in South Carolina where we did the uh, the Wild Weasel mission. And then I was in, I became an instructor pilot after a few years. And then it was uh, 2016 that we deployed to Afghanistan. What did they have you doing? And where were you based out of? Bagram. Okay. I mean, it was, so when we first heard that, so I reclama twice. So reclama is where you, you stay back. So I ended up spending three and a half years at Shaw because I wanted to go on this deployment. Um, but when we heard it was, it was Afghanistan, we were all a little disappointed because of the drawdown. There wasn't a lot going on out there. Yeah. We deployed first two months as expected, nothing really going on. We were supporting a lot of different ops, but we weren't dropping a lot of ordnance. Did you fly your F-16 to Afghanistan? Uh, the squadron did. So I was on the advanced team. So I went out there on a C-17 about a week ahead of time and yeah. set everything up and, and got everything, uh, uh, transferred over from the F-16s that were out there. But yeah, we, we fly the F-16s there and back. I feel like that's not a comfortable flight. I feel like that's a lot of time in that aircraft. <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> so, I mean, coming back, it was it was four hours to Qatar. Um, and then, of course, the, t- the tanker broke for two weeks because their windshield wiper broke in Spain. You know, oh, weird. Standard. Yeah, it's like standard. when I would deploy pre-911, our first hop would be Hawaii. And they always had an engine issue that they couldn't fix during high winds, mm-hmm. which is every fucking day. Yeah, the good spots. I wasn't complaining at all because we hung out in Waikiki for two weeks. But it's interesting how planes never break in Bagram, right. but they always break in Hawaii. Yeah, or Weird. Al-Udeed. Yeah. So, I mean, we were stuck in a tent with 50 people in Fuck. Al-Udeed. We'd been gone for seven months. All our families are waiting for us. And they're waiting on a goddamn wind- windshield wiper in, in Marone, yeah. Spain. Um, but that eventually showed up. And it was 10 hours flying to Spain. Oh, so you're flying with the tanker, so you can just hop on oh, and yeah. off the thing? Because we can only fly, you know, less than 1,000 miles with uh, with our fuel tanks. Holy shit. So you're, you're, you're flying w- with the tanker. And then out of Spain, we go to South Carolina. So we took off six F-16s with two tankers. The first tanker refueled us a third of the way across the Atlantic, turned back to Europe, and then oh, we wow. start refueling off the second tanker. It was... Uh, so it was a ten. It was a ten and a half hour flight. We refueled ten times each because you always want to be topped off to give you options. Are you guys just flying like a V up there, mm-hmm. just kind of with the tanker? Yeah, with the tanker. Wow. Um, for like three hours, there was weather, so we had to stay in fingertip formation. So you know, about three three feet separation. And I mean, it's all manual, so you're just like that's exhausting. Yeah, you're taking uh, you know go pills. Yeah. Uh, um, just to stay stay alert, stay conscious. <sighs> You're in a you know anti exposure suit. It was actually kind of a big deal. We uh, so we had gotten stuck in the deed for two weeks, and then uh, the weather was was rolling in, and the waves were thirty feet in the Atlantic. Oh boy! And so typically, unless we're doing what's called the AOS movement across the Atlantic, uh, I think it's ten foot wave heights is the max because they can't save you after that. Yeah. And so we all had to get together and say. You know, is this something we really want to do? If nobody wants to do it, if anybody doesn't want to do it, we'll just stay. And we're like, let's, let's, the fuck let's out roll here. the bones. <laughs> so, uh, but I mean, looking down, these waves are the size of a house. Like, it was, it was pretty crazy. Um, what altitude are you crossing at? I think we were mid-20s. I'm surprised you guys didn't go higher. Uh, I think the tanker had some issues with, well, first of all, tanking at high altitudes is really tough. Okay. Um, the controls are really sluggish. And then the tanker being heavy, I think, has some issues yeah, getting that high. Limited, uh, limited, yeah. So, but yeah, the la- uh, about a third or half the way through it, we had to stay, uh, we had some weather, stay in fingertip for three hours, and that's just exhausting uh, yeah. doing that, and then uh, was able to, to make it home. So it does take forever, but uh, yeah, we were, in, we were in Bagram for the full, uh, full seven months. First two months was, was pretty much as expected, pretty boring, and then that's when uh, Mattis took over as Secretary of Defense, yeah. and ISIS was starting to... Uh, to take over the uh, Nangarhar region. And so after that, uh, Mattis said he wanted ISIS annihilated in the country. And so the Air Force didn't know what that meant. And so they spent two weeks figuring out what annihilated meant. And after that, it meant we were cleaning the rails every flight. Were you just working a lot with JTACs and CCT on the ground and just? 
we were doing a lot of that because they were doing clearing ops in the Nangahar region, so mm-hmm. pretty high risk stuff. We were the only fighters in the country, so we were, you know, our strength is going fast. So we were, we'd work on the, the uh, Iran border. We would work in Helmand province. We'd work on the Pakistani border. We'd have to have multiple uh, PMDs, like uh, mission data cards, to be able to work different sides of the country. Yeah. But yeah, um, the really busy parts were when they were doing clearing ops in the Nangahar region, and we were the only fighters. So. We're dropping a lot of ordnance out there. What's your average drop altitude? Like your average uh, profile when you're rolling in, where do you guys actually release at? Uh, f- for the F-16, when we were flying those missions, you know, 15,000 feet. So you were dropping smart bombs? We were dropping smart bombs. I strafed a couple times. Yeah. Uh, we were also dropping or uh, shooting the AGR-20s. I don't know if you ever had a chance to see those, the APKWS, Advanced mm. Precision Weapon Kill System. No. It's those uh, old Vietnam-era 2.75 inch rockets, but fitted with a laser seeker. They're really perfect for Afghanistan. We were the first. We were we were one of the first, first or second squadron to fly with those. I mean, we had to load those up as dumb Mark eighty two bombs because the jet couldn't even understand what those were. <laughs> so we're like, because you know, we found out we were going to get them a couple of weeks before, and we're like, how do we use these things? And so we had to figure that out. And wow. they turned out to be perfect for Afghanistan. Nail drivers, ten pound warheads. Um, I mean, that's exactly what you want. Low collateral damage. Yeah. So we were using that a lot. We were using, yeah, smart bombs, GB 54s, uh, GBU 38s. Uh, we even put on some GB 31, 2000 pound bombs. Yeah. But yeah, for the, for the next four months, five months, we were just dropping every bomb we had every, every sortie, that's which, awesome. was, which was, I mean, pretty crazy because most of our friends in Syria thought they were lucky and then it turned into drawdown for them and we started getting really busy. And that was all F-16 at that time or were you guys were you guys flirting with the F-35 then too? No, we were the only fighter squad in the country. Okay. So we had so 12 F-16s for an entire country and that was all the fighters. And so we were doing 24-hour ops, two F-16s, four-hour rolls. Yeah. But we get extended pretty much every time to like six hours. Yeah. And by that, you mean two in the air at any time? Two in there at any time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, it's it's pretty cool to uh, typically, as we were talking before, like you're going out with these packages of 100 aircraft. Here, you know, if you're the flight lead, I was usually the flight lead. You're in charge of 100% of the fast cast. You're making the decisions. Do we, you know, do we handle this uh, tick that's going on near that Nangahar region, or there's you know some special ops thing going on in the Helmand region? So you're making a lot of decisions that you really wouldn't as part of a, a bigger package. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Pros and cons of being in a small unit like that, or a small footprint, I should say. Mm-hmm. What'd you do after you got back from that deployment? Uh, so midway through the deployment, found out I was going to the F thirty five. So I had you put in for that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that was my number one pick. And at the time, you know, a lot of the pilots thought I was crazy because F thirty five had a lot of issues back then. Like what? Um, it was just, uh, you know, they were, it was G limited. The sensors working weren't working that well. Uh, the program was having a lot of issues as well because it's a joint program, so it's uh, and international. So uh, there's a Marine variant, a Navy variant, mm-hmm. and there's uh, international partners. I think 13 other countries uh, as of a couple months ago. So uh, yeah, there are a lot of issues. But I mean, any jet has a lot of issues. The F-16 lost. We've lost 600 in the U.S. over the years. What an insane amount! At there how are times, many of that in combat? Like three. Uh, no, I mean we lost a good amount in during the Gulf War, uh, but most fit training, and Fuck. there there are years training years where we were losing one every three weeks. Why single engine? I mean it was known as the lawn dart back in the day, and it was also the first electric jet, so fly by wire mm. jet. So I mean it had a lot of issues too. Same thing with with any new jet. So the F thirty five was having a lot of teething issues. But I had been to a bunch of advanced exercises, um, like at Nellis, red flags, things like that. Yeah. And uh, I had seen the writing on the wall where, especially wild weasel pilots, we were, you know, our motto is first in, last out, but we weren't doing that anymore. We were hanging way back, not going into the mezes, the missile engagement zones, and just lobbing in hard missiles while the F-22, F-35s, the fifth gen players went in and did all the uh, the good stuff. So Is the F-35 considered a fifth gen fighter? Yeah. A term yeah. I didn't know of until I saw Maverick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's it's the newest one. We we call the F-22s legacy fifth gen and they're not okay. fans of that, but they are retiring the F-22 in the 2030s. Didn't they just put that thing into service not too long ago? Yeah. It's like the, the second newest jet. Why would they already have a hang up date on that? Because they only built 180 of them. 
So oh, and they're just they kept getting out. cuts. Yeah, they kept getting cuts to them, um, and so they only ended up building 180. And these jets are so software dependent that you can either do a software upgrade that's billions of dollars that can help 4,000 jets. The F-35 is projected to be 4,000 or 180 jets. Yeah. So F-22 is a fantastic jet, but it's a victim of just being having a small footprint. Those jets can do some crazy things. Yeah, the the flight surface options on that mm-hmm. you i'm like it's like watching iron man when he gets in his suit the first time you're like holy shit yeah yeah <laughs> i mean it's it's uh the best aerodynamic jet out there like yeah. it's it it was during a really key and interesting time during the 90s is when it was built when they're moving from like should we build a jet like an f-16 or should we build a jet like the f-35 and they're yeah. like why don't we just split the difference and make it ultra maneuverable and also make it uh, like a flying sensor it's crazy Huh. And I'm assuming the F-22 uh, role will just be absorbed by the F-35s? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it does a pretty good job. And there's just so much uh, so much money going into it, so many upgrades going into it that, uh, yeah, it's a it's a fantastic jet now. So my friends, they thought they were, I was crazy back in the day. They thought I was just, I don't know if you know, an F-117, those old uh, stealth fighters. Oh, yeah. The, bombing only. Yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yep. Yeah. The, so the, the initial read on the f-35 was it was just a you know f-117 with amram missiles but it's you know as you see with the the air show clip like it's yeah. it's really matured and it's it's far better than it was even a couple of years ago is it the marine corps variant that does the vertical takeoff mm-hmm. or do they yeah. all, are they all capable of that no just the marine variant okay that caused that's that's the biggest consternation that was the biggest issue because i mean imagine being an engineer you have to design the latest supersonic stealth fighter has to you know, have better sensors than ever before. Yeah. And this thing has to hover. Like it's just an insane order for a, uh, for an engineering team. And yeah. so that's, that was the key part. <clears throat> Bless you. That was the key piece that, uh, that caused a lot of issues for the F 35. Yeah. That is a tall order. All that stuff in there. And by the way, vertical takeoff yeah, and landing. And just hover. At sea. Okay. I know. <laughs> I, I still haven't seen it. I don't believe it. Um, Michael? F thirty five vertical takeoff at sea, Marine Corps. I've definitely seen on 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 uh, on video, but we had a uh, we had F thirty five B at the air show, and he was not allowed to hover. And I was like, why? Because of those rules, regulations. Like it turn, he's allowed to land at slow speed, but not hover. And I was like, I don't believe it. I don't think you guys can really hover. <laughs> so the plane you fly looks like that, but it just can't do the vertical takeoff essentially. And it has the gun, so okay. it, it shoots. 180 rounds of those. I mean, this guy's about to do it. That is so fucking crazy. Yeah. I feel like the most dangerous time would be transitioning from horizontal or vertical to horizontal flight. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Apparently it's it's a three hour class to learn how to hover this thing for a F-35 three hour pilot. Yeah, like it's it's simple. Like the the Harrier, the Widowmaker, tons of people died in it. Yeah, this, you know, apparently it's it's like a drone. Like it's it's easy. I mean, I don't, I, I don't know if it is, but that's that's what my friends say. It takes I got three hours, hours to spare. All right, let's do it. We we'll have do it so, together. So far, we have three videos in this series we're going to do. Yeah, we can go to Yuma and do it. It's going to be called They'll Hazard and Andy Kill Michael. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do the fun stuff. <laughs> yeah, you're the test dummy. Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll test ejection seats with you, Michael. 10 the, Gs, 12 Gs. Fine. Yeah, we got to get him in the dunker and not help him when he can't get out. Okay. So that'll be good. We'll let you go unconscious underwater. I'm not sure what the dunker is. Don't worry about don't it. Like you don't it. even <laughs> need to know. <laughs> Yeah, a new challenge every day. Yeah, I like it. You know, back in the '90s, they they put pilots up to 12 Gs, so it is possible. Their their videos on YouTube. Like, Did their uh, retinas detach? I, I don't know. It it doesn't sound healthy. It really doesn't. I have bad eyesight, anyways. You do? Mm-hmm. It could help you. You could, it could you know, help. turn yeah. superhuman. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, it's like the X Men training protocol for you. Yeah, it's like getting bit <laughs> by a spider. I love it. All right, how was uh? So how was your first flight in the F? Oh, when did you get into the F thirty five? Could you come back from that deployment? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, found out in Afghanistan, and then had to to wrap up a few things. Like everybody kind of goes off in their own directions yeah, after sure. deployments, and uh, came to uh, Luke Air Force Base to learn how to fly the F thirty five. Yeah, they put you through simulators at the time. At the time, it actually wasn't too bad. Like it was. So now the upgrade is really tough. Um, but back then, there's a lot of issues, and it was. 
it was uh, we were mostly figuring out how to not break the jet. There weren't a lot of tactics yet, hmm. so um, so the upgrade wasn't that bad. But it was it, like like I was saying before, it took a, it took about a year to really start getting comfortable with the jet. You know, you're just used to flying the F-16, especially me. I, I, I uh, how many hours did you have in the F-16 at that point? I think I had 1,200 something okay hours. So pretty experienced in the F-16. Yep. And so you know, it just was instinct. And so kind of undoing that, there's a lot of negative transfer. Although the F-16, especially a Block 50 um, Wild Weasel pilot, that's the best transition to the F-35 because we have other pilots, A-10 pilots, F-22 pilots coming to the F-35, and it's a more difficult transition hmm. because, um, you know, the F-16, you're kind of a jack of all trades. Same thing with the F-35. So it's really the people that are hyper-specialized. The F-15C guys focus purely on air-to-air -air or the A-10 pilots that have issues you know, learning the other half of flying. Yeah. So they, they generally have a little bit of issues, nothing that, you know, studying can't fix. But, uh, yeah, it takes takes about a year to really start getting current and uh, and good at flying the F-35. But, you know, it's, it's pretty crazy. It's just a new way of thinking with the F-35. You're talking stealth. You're talking fantastic sensors, sensor fusion. That's something that the F-16 did not have. So the F-16 was like that Cessna 152, like <laughs> – it had it was a rat's nest of technology. So we had like, we had like, uh, it's not fair to say it's a '70s jet. So it was like a '90s, it was '80s, '90s, 2000s technology all tied together. You'd have your radar warning system that would be separate from your radar, all kinds of different sensors, and your the your brain's the fusion for that. And unfortunately, in the F-16, we had like six times the sea fit controlled flight and a terrain of other jets just because there's so much to do, especially if you're flying at low level, which we were doing a lot of. Was that just pilot saturation causing that? Some of it is the G-lock, and then some of it's the saturation where they're just working the radar and then run into a, a mountain or something like Describe that. Describe G-lock, if you will. G-lock, well, that's the that's the Tito thing. So uh, G-induced loss of consciousness. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we're pulling upwards of nine Gs. That's draining the blood from your brain. And if you lose enough blood, you'll pass out. You'll be incapacitated for about 30 seconds. It's a long time at the speeds you guys are cooking. Yeah, especially, you know, when you're pulling a max uh, performance maneuver like that, you're generally going to be nose low using some radial G, um, some gravity to help you out. You'll be in max afterburner. And so, like I said, we've lost about one pilot a year over the last 30 years to, to G-lock. So they, they become incapacitated. They wake up after like 10 seconds, but they just, you don't know where you are. Um, yeah. and you're flying max afterburner pointing towards the ground Fuck. and, uh, yeah, I mean, those accident reports are, are pretty bad cause they don't, you don't find anything when you're, you know, you find very small things when you're going 800 miles an hour into the ground. It was, uh, when I was flying, I always paid attention to the incident reports, the civilian ones. Shocking how many of them are controlled flight into terrain, perfectly functioning aircraft mm -hmm. and just straight into a fucking mountain. Yeah. It just... Lack of prioritization. I mean, or that's... people over their skis, t taking off in VFR conditions, thinking that everything's going to be fine mm -hmm. and not paying attention to the weather, finding themselves in IFR conditions for the first time. And I think I know how to do this. Oh, bam. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's really tough because when you're first learning to fly, you learn to fly by the seat of your pants. Like you want to look out. You don't want to be looking at the gauges yeah. like when you're doing steep turns and things like that. Same with flying fighters. But then when you transition to IFR, now you're ignoring the seat of the pants flying yeah. and you're just focusing on the instruments. And yep. I think most people kind of bias towards one or the other. They're pilots that, you know, have good hands, real good at uh, stick and rudder stuff, and they have trouble flying IFR. That was me. Like that was probably the biggest hmm. difficulty that I had in pilot training was learning how to fly under instruments. Really? Yeah. I mean, formation came pretty naturally. Stick and rudder stuff came pretty naturally. Um, but, uh, Flying IFR just heads down. It is wild when you feel like you're in like a left or a right hand turn, and you're and you're flying completely off of the uh, attitude indicator. Mm -hmm. Like, fuck, it's telling me it's straight. I feel like I'm going right. It's telling yeah. me it's straight. Go straight. Go straight. Go straight. Well, the really <laughs> bad thing is on a tanker. Like tankers, you know, when you're in the clouds, you don't have any of those references. You're just looking at the director lights. Oh god, it's a full manual maneuver. So you're fully following this tanker. It's where's the um probe coming into the f-16 behind you okay so so when you're when you're refueling you want to try to hit your head on the probe just really slowly so yep. you're going like two miles an hour they'll move the probe out of the way and then you pull up and then they'll stick the probe in the back and you're just staying in that position for like five to ten minutes there's some director lights telling you to go forward aft yeah um down up 
And so you're just focused on that, but it's, you know, the tanker has to turn to stay in their orbit. Yeah. And so you'll be in this like two or three minute turn and that'll become the new normal. And so there've been a lot of people that have gone like <laughs> oh, spatial lead and done like barrel rolls and stuff like that underneath a tanker. So that's, that's really where you know, oh, some guys wild. get into issues. Okay. I, I think that was my favorite part of flying was at shooting actual instrument approaches. I just, I loved it. Um, I liked the integration of the sensors and I'd like, I, in, uh, like the whole, the whole aspect of it. San Diego, again, it was perfect. It was like great weather almost all the time. So you could go do whatever you want, but I would just get up early and shoot like six approaches every day, seven days a week. It was fucking awesome. Yeah. I mean, there's something, there's a precision to it. Yeah. And, and it's, it's a extremely useful skill. Like I tell all my friends and family, like if you're going to get a pilot's license, you have to get, get your, IFR. Otherwise you, I mean, you get to fly when it's perfect conditions. And you never know, like in Phoenix, like the weather will roll in in 30 yep. minutes and then you're in IFR conditions and then you can easily kill yourself. Yes. So many, so many <laughs> like doctor, doctors, lawyers, they, yeah. they've gone spatial D and killed themselves. But yeah. I, Generally in Moonies for some reason. It's the doctor yeah, killer the was doctor the name killer. on that one. Yep. Yep. <laughs> um, but yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I like, I like shooting approaches. Like yeah. there's some precision to it. You're, uh, you're working as a team with, with the controllers on the ground i mean it's kind of like uh doing cast close air support yeah that kind of the synchronized back and forth yeah and it's also just cool when you shoot one well like taking it all the way down to minimums and you pop out and you're like fucking awesome there's the runway right there yep yep yeah there's something cool to it for sure I, I like the the opposite when you are taking off like i mean we were doing this from the air show uh saturday sunday was beautiful we left monday it was overcast down to 200 feet just dreary gray yeah and uh once we took off perfect super you know it's so bright you don't realize how bright it is like i don't think our eyes really are used to that transition of going from like overcast to uh to full daylight so i mean that that always catches me by surprise even with the visors that we have but i think that's the best feeling like you're leaving you know that shitty weather yeah and you're seeing a perfect day out there that was that cool thing about the approaches in san diego too because it's you get up at the montgomery field get up above it beautiful dive back down into the may gray like misty up up and just doing that rotation of back through yeah yeah it was awesome and then another thing that's similar to that is like at bagram i'm sure you've been to bagram right many times yeah so i mean all those fifteen thousand foot mountains around there so like the sun in the in the winter sets at like maybe like 334 yeah and so you'll be almost taken off it's post sunset and then you'll take off and then it'll be a a bright day so you'll you'll take off and then you'll see the sun again so So that was always a, a pretty cool feeling. What uh, what got you to your? I know you wanted to be an author and do stuff with YouTube. When did you start thinking about getting out? When did it start tugging at you? Uh, after I came back from Afghanistan. So like, you know, even before you got into the F thirty five. Yeah, because I had I had a few months off, mm-hmm. um, waiting to fly the F thirty five, and so. I was just writing some of the stories that that we had there because I mean there's a lot of stuff that went on. We had uh, like a, a suicide bomber uh, infiltrate the base and detonate himself, and so there's there's that. Um, you know, there's there's just a lot of lot of stuff that we saw out there. So I was just kind of processing it, writing writing it down, and I was like, you know, it might be interesting to like write a book about this. About the same time, uh, Luke was looking for Luke Air Force Base was looking for a speaker on Memorial Day to to speak at this town called Carefree. And so I started speaking, or I, I gave a speech there. There was a teacher in the crowd who was like, my students really need to hear this stuff. Can you come speak there? And so I started speaking in schools and figured there, you know, all the students really enjoyed it. A lot of them wanted to become fighter pilots. A lot didn't have any contact with the military at all. So it was yeah. just this big, scary thing to them. So I could kind of put a face to it. And so I started a podcast out of there and, uh, I wanted to write, but then I realized you really have to have an audience to be able to write a book. Otherwise, nobody's going to buy your book. Um, so yep. then I started the podcast. That turned into kind of YouTube stuff. And then full circle, the book's going to be coming out in a couple of weeks. What are you talking about? It's right here. I actually haven't seen the, the finished <laughs> copy. This is the first time I've seen it. I have they some sent advanced me two. Copies. Would you like to have one of those? <laughs> I need to tell them. Come on. I wrote the damn thing. But... Uh, yeah, I mean it was it was it was a cool experience. Like I I wrote every word in the book. Yeah, uh, it was a six year journey because that's really where I, I started wanting to be an author, and then I had to figure out how to write. So I started doing some like guest blogs and things like that, and uh, 
then you have to live like a monk, like for 500 days straight, I wrote every single day, usually like four hours in the morning. Did you have a, like a word goal or what'd you set for yourself as far as a template? Yeah. Like 500 words. Like I'm just a super slow writer. Yeah. Um, same here. So, so yeah, I just, I would try to write 500 words. Okay. Some days I wouldn't quite get there. Some days it would just pop off and I would write like 2000 words. Some days I would write 2,000 words and be pumped and then go back and realize it was terrible. Um, I think it's more about getting the words on paper, not necessarily the quality. And I, I say that as somebody who's not an author, but have some friends that are. And they're like, yeah, not every uh, not every swing is going to be a home run. Mm-hmm. You know, some of them you're striking out, but it's, it's more the repetition and actually getting it done. Yeah. I, well, I mean, that's what they say. Just write a crappy first draft. And so I wrote a crappy first draft and then I was like, oh man, I have a lot of work to do. And so I went through like nine <laughs> revisions and I thought the publisher, I thought we'd be having like team meetings and the publisher would be doing stuff like they, you know, I, I was just on my own yeah. writing this thing for a year. Um, but like I said, 500 days in a row, it was the second uh, Thanksgiving that my wife's like on Christmas, you know, you're taking a day off. And I was like, all right. That's fair. Yeah, that is that's fair. fair. So, so you... When did you inform the Air Force that, hey, this active duty thing, eh, perhaps reserves? Uh, well, the thing is about Luke Air Force Base, they have a reservist squadron there. So, you know, that was actually the most competitive thing I've ever gone into. Really? Yeah, because everybody, you know, most people, you can do most things in the reserves that you can do active duty. like. Most reservists are full time. At the time, there were only three part time F thirty five pilots. Hmm. So everybody else was full time in the reserves. I think uh, it's about twenty percent of the Air Force are reservists. We're moving to thirty percent just to retain more people. Interesting, because I think the training's like fifty million dollars. So every time somebody just leaves and goes to the airlines, they they yeah. lose that and like and the five airlines to ten go, years of experience. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we had so so it's it's pretty competitive joining the reserves. We had like twenty one experienced fighter pilots show up to to the board and I think we selected or they selected six and I was fortunately one of those pilots um but uh, yeah at the time there were only three part-time F35 pilots and they're like you know is this going to work it, you know yeah especially with how these upgrades are coming down the the pipeline and uh you know it's it's tough you definitely have to like kind of reduce your sphere and and know your limits um but uh but yeah it's been good but I was gonna say it netted you more time elsewhere because then you could do more writing if you wanted to, mm-hmm. podcasting, YouTube. Tell me about your YouTube page, Michael. Can you pull up his uh, its page because it's awesome. If you're into like aviation or just, I uh, like I watched a shit ton of the videos just because I love. I haven't flown in years, but I love jets and flying shit. So, but you tell the story of it. All right. Uh, well, well, thanks. That's that's great to hear that that you're enjoying it. Um, I just want to. Well, first of all, there's not many pilots doing this stuff. I feel like there's a lot of special forces people out there telling the story and you know like you you guys are doing a good job Jocko Willick um in the air force most pilots go off and fly for the airlines like i think it's too comfortable of a job so people yeah. don't like take a chance and go out there and that's one thing i didn't want to do it's such an easy transition out. so it, easy yeah it's it's uh there are a lot of guys in the world that come from that will go uh government contractor they literally are well I was going to say they're literally doing the same job, but they get paid differently. But that's not really the case. But it's the vast majority of their skill sets are overlaying, and it's enticing because mm-hmm. it's like putting on an old pair of shoes. Right. As opposed to going out there and maybe you like to wear stilettos. I'm not going to tell <laughs> you, you know, what you – I don't know what you're flying yeah, with whatever, up there. Yeah, you, I got six-inch pumps on underneath yeah. here. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I love that picture. Fuck, that's such a good picture. That was – so So uh, it is interesting. I mean, we had – I had a – figure out a lot of interesting things because the Air Force is like, you know, how do we quite you yeah. know, handle this? And so one of the things is, is uh, so so that was at uh, Nellis Air Force Base. They, it's pretty interesting. We were doing physiological monitoring. So these jets, $100 million a piece, they see out to the horizon, but there's nothing monitoring the pilots, which would be useful for all these G-locks and things like that. Yeah. So we went out there and showcased some of the testing. Hold on, that they win a real fighter jet? Let's talk offline to make sure that I actually win that. Win a flight. Oh, yeah. damn it. Yeah. Let's get rid of that flight. But you've already been in F-18, though, so. Yeah, she let me fly it for a little bit, too. All right. <laughs> nice. How, how did how'd it feel? Uh, You know, you push down and things get bigger and you pull back up and things get smaller. <laughs> yeah, it, like, don't overcomplicate it. I, honestly, like most airplanes, 
Like, fuck, at a general level, pull back on the control surfaces and things will get... Sm- pull that shit back up there, Michael. We're not done. We're fucking talking about it. I love it. I mean, yeah, you're, you're clearly a good pilot because... Because people like to overcomplicate. I'm not smart it. enough to overcomplicate anything. I like. <laughs> I need gross fucking motor skills. What of all? How many videos have you done so far? Uh, pri- uh hundreds. Probably. What's been your favorite? Uh, I mean, the one with with Tito was great. Yeah. Uh, Michael, scroll down a little bit. Oh, damn you, Michael. Go back to that. Scroll down. This is the shit that blows my mind. Go down more, more. Those complex the most complex so yeah holy shit yeah you need to you need to have terry verts okay on this i'll 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 connect the space shuttle yeah that's the space shuttle so i'm gonna claim i could fly that fucker right now i would we had a competition i would pay attention to none of the information it was giving me and just look out the windows and fly it we me and terry had a (laughs) uh, a landing competition on it he uh he won by a little bit but uh, yeah i mean it's crazy like he he showed us around the space shuttle um, Michael, go back to the beginning of that video, just where it's mm-hmm. like it shows the cockpit, like just oh my god, it's insane. That it's is insane so much information, and so many things to go wrong. Uh, MFDs, PFDs, like hopefully it's all made by the lowest bidder as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it is. I think it is, and it still costs a couple billion dollars. But yeah, it's like. I mean, it was cool to just talk with Terry, like Terry Verts. Like yeah. he, he was a space shuttle pilot, and yeah. then he went on to be the commander of the the space Fuck. station. Fuck. So like he has, you know, stories of coming back at Mach twenty. Yeah. And so he's flying flying the shuttle, and they they put the payload uh, operators down below deck. So four people are above, a couple of people below, and so the cardinal rule is like, as a pilot, you never say what's that, and like. There's like a big bang at Mach 20, and he's like, "What's that?" And all those guys are sweating bullets. Yeah, people down, down below. You used to hear yeah. "What'd you say? What'd you say? Shut the fuck!" <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so uh, he's like, "Yeah, they investigated. It. It's just like some anomaly that always happens with this space shuttle going yeah. Mach 20. So I guess it's not a big deal, but like, just insane to hear some of those stories, or like how the uh, the booster separation rockets are similar to our Amram missile rockets. Yeah. So they like shoot off the uh, the side boosters. And like he was, he was talking about, and I think it's like this for me. He was there during the golden age of, of space. Like he would not want to be an astronaut now because everything's automated. Same thing now. More I think systems the, management. Yeah, I think the F sixteen, F thirty five. They're kind of the the pinnacle. And then after this, we're going to start getting really automated stuff. So, um, so it's just cool to hear some of his stories. What's your approach to your uh, YouTube channel? How do you decide on what it is that you want to make a video out of? Personal desires or interests? Try to, yeah, something I'm interested in. I, I used to do a lot of talking head videos, but I like getting out there, mixing it up. So, yeah, Terry and I went on the Zero G Vomit Comet, which was pretty cool. So where they go, you go weightless. The, oh, yeah, the what? Uh, yeah, you see that astronaut training a mm-hmm. lot as well. Yeah, yeah, so, I mean, that was that was a pretty cool experience to They're just doing, to go they're do flying that. parabolas, right? Yeah, just yeah. parabolas, 15 yeah. to 20 seconds of weightlessness. Um, so that was pretty cool. He was saying... That we're lucky that we weren't on the the Russian one because the Russian one is like a twenty foot bay, and so people will float up to the top and then just smash. You got you got, you got fifteen <laughs> seconds, then you're getting two G's, and so people just like break their neck. That's so, an episode four in our series. Michael getting smashed right on here. the Russian yeah. vomit comet. We got to rent the vo- vomit <laughs> comet from. <laughs> Fuck, we have a banger series lined up. I think we do. This, this looks great. I can't um, wait personally. This was awesome. Find the. First civilian F-16s. It's insane the amount of paperwork they had to go through with the State Department. Like years of uh, of stuff. And these are Israeli F-16s. Yep. They were on the like 1980s nuclear raid. They've shot down aircraft. Okay. Um, they're they're the stripped down hot rods. There's no gun in them. They didn't give you a single seater though, did they? No. no. Unbelievable. I, I, yeah. Unbelievable. I just in the back seat. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that was pretty close. Yeah. Um, that was very Maverickish. Yeah. But uh, how many times did you hang out? Uh, underneath uh, two airplanes that were having a conversation and then roll out over to the top. All, all the time. Yeah, it was like just one to two feet. Yeah, one to two feet from glass to glass. Never mind you the know, fact that the depending, tail fin depends might actually if we strike. played volleyball that day. Fuck. Their shirts off and <laughs> jeans. But yeah, this was a this was a fun one to do. Cause I, Is that Vegas? No, it's Phoenix. Okay. I was going to say, most wild shit happens in Vegas. when Because I think they have a gunfighter school there in uh, Turbo Props in Vegas where you go out and you dogfight each that's, other. That's a video that we're doing. We're looking for somebody to do it. You want to you wanna fight? Fuck yes. All right. Let's do you it. have to wear an eye patch and you can't use your dominant hand. 
<laughs> I'm a hundred percent in. I'm not current and flying at all, but let's fucking go do it. All right, yeah. We're, we're, and I got buddies down there because we can go down. Michael, you want to come? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, we'll sky train, combat sport. Yeah, we'll train jujitsu with uh, Henry. Let's do strafing runs. He runs through the desert, and we shoot inert rounds at him. But they'll probably kill him. But that's fine. He's he's here for the content. It's okay. He'll wear we many GoPros. Drop uh, like flower bombs on him. <laughs> you know. Chuck that out the window. I'm 100% down to do that if you want to do that. All right, let's do it. Yeah. Like I said, we, you know, I've talked with the school. They're they're fully on board. We were just looking for the right guest to to do that with. I'm fucking so, down. Yeah, let's let's uh, let's do that. But yeah, this was a really fun video to make. I don't know. It's just I feel like there's not a lot of people in the aviation space doing engaging videos like this. So well, you're looking at it from an angle that. There's aviation, and then there's the stuff that you got to fly and the things that you got to do, and that you might as well try to broad jump the Grand Canyon. Like your average aviator, even on the path that I was on, the apex for me was flying 135, you know, in the Gulfstream in the Citation. I got to go see a bunch of cool places, but at the end of the day, it's very rote. Well, here's our flight plan. Here, let's log our flight plan, get to see portions. I mean, like the coolest thing I saw was a, a lightning and thunderstorm from above. I think we were at like four, five, zero, just hucking you know, across. I was, I was looking down. I was like, what the fuck is that? I was like, oh my God, we're watching lightning from above. That's so different than the things that you get to do. And so there's aviation, but then there's the type of aviation that mm-hmm. you used to do. And I think because almost nobody can touch that, the interest level is just through the roof. Yeah. And, you know, fortunately, a lot of these companies trust me, I guess, to tell the story. You know, there's not a lot of like people on YouTube out there that kind of have a, a professional aviation background like that. So, yeah. So I, I don't think like top aces would have trusted like some twenty year old YouTuber, but I was like, Look, that would be we're going to tell the story video. correctly, <laughs> yeah. And like you know, I know about OPSEC. And, well, like yeah. the Nellis video was really big. They were like, we're not going to declassify these F sixteens. We're gonna we're gonna let you guys to fly them. Like we're trusting you guys mm-hmm. with this. And I was like, don't worry, I'll I'll make sure that everything's good to go with yeah. that. I'm very cautious with my previous career as well. There's things that I'll talk about broadly, and then there's things that I will always talk around. And for the listener, they would never know. Mm-hmm. But I know that people who are still doing that job would appreciate it because I'm not interested in putting anybody's life in, in jeopardy or in danger at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's, that's you know, I kind of like doing these peripheral things. Like, I don't necessarily want to dig down on, like, stealth technology and, like, things that, you know, AMRAM missile technology, things yeah. that can, you know, get me in trouble as well as things that, uh, you know, I don't want to get close to divulging anything like that. So this is like a fun way to show aviation that a lot of people are into as opposed to just hardcore, you know, military aviation people. What was your call sign? Hazard. That's bullshit. That's just your fucking... Yeah, because, you know, we, you know, you know, in the squadron, people just know you. What's your real first name then? First name's Justin. I was going to say, you have the coolest fucking first (laughs) name ever. So everybody knew me as Hazard. So I was like... How'd you get that name? So, so here's the thing. I'll tell you offline because the, okay. the uh, <laughs> that means it's a good story. <laughs> it is a good story, but more than that, like I don't know. Our tradition, in, at least in my last couple of squadrons, has been you tell it over a glass of whiskey mm-hmm. and uh, you don't tell it publicly. Okay. So, you know, so if anybody out there, you know, I have some whiskey, you know, I'll be more than happy right. to uh, to tell you my call sign, Michael. Since you're going to be part of this video series, your call mm-hmm. sign is Bottom Bunk. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's fine. <laughs> that's the, Air, the Air Force is pretty good with I'm gonna call signs. I'm going to get a patch for him that says bottom bunk. Navy and Marines, <laughs> brutal call signs. <laughs> Terrible call signs. Yeah, I it's think- not based on anything you did well. Your nickname or call sign yeah. should be something that has a very pejorative nature to it. I mean, same same with mine. It was from a time I almost, you know, Perfect. ordered myself. So. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's never like, oh, Hollywood, because he's yeah. really cool. Like It's Anybody- always something like stupid or something dangerous or like a play on your last name. So, uh, yeah, you run into a Marine. And they're like, oh, yeah, my nickname's Bone Crush. I'm like, no, you gave that to yourself. <laughs> I'm not calling you that. <laughs> exactly. Awesome. Exactly. Um, well, I'm trying to be cognizant of the time because I know you have a flight. It's a two, right? Yeah, I mean. We're good. I, I, wanted to, well, I, wanted to I don't mind about, pushing the limit. Well, the airport, you'll get through it quickly, but I want to make sure you have time to get there. But I also want to talk about your book. Talk to me about what it is you were trying to accomplish in the book. Yeah, so for the book, I really wanted to – be able to combine storytelling with some lessons learned. I, I really enjoy authors like Malcolm Gladwell, 
Atul Gawande, who was a surgeon who wrote The Checklist Manifesto and Being Mortal. The Checklist Manifesto. I'll He's probably my favorite out. author. Okay. Fantastic, uh, fantastic author. But it's it's like 80% storytelling, 20% lessons learned. I don't necessarily like like self-help books that's like just white papers on how to, yeah. how to be better. I, I think the context is the most important part. So I really wanted to incorporate you know, interesting stories, some of them from my time flying, but I also pulled on other stories like Air France 447, where the co-pilot ended up stalling the aircraft from 35,000 feet. Have you heard of that? Tell me more. I so, have not heard of that. How I feel like he had to try really hard to do that. Oh, man, it's it's insane. Like, yeah, as a pilot, it's going to infuriate you. Um, so taking off from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, yep. bound for France, uh, about so they're a third up, of the way through. They're up just cruise altitude. Thirty five thousand feet. Yeah. They're going through the intratropical convergence zone. It's where the uh the air from the north, northern hemisphere meets the southern hemisphere and produces a lot of thunderstorms and they lose contact. And so they find a bunch of uh wreckage floating on the surface. It takes them two years to be able to find the actual black, black boxes. Box. Which are orange, by the way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Go figure. Um Michael, but, what are you? Michael's just over here watching fucking YouTube <laughs> while we're talking. What are you looking yeah. at over there, Michael? Uh, Air France four four seven. Well, that's not Air France four four seven. I'm pulling it. <laughs> yeah, it's insane though. Like so. So what happened was, uh, God damn. it was an inexperienced co-pilot flying through this thunderstorm. Yeah. The the, uh, the pilot, the captain, had gone back to sleep, so left the uh, the number two co-pilot yep. uh, in charge, and then there's another co-pilot who worked. Uh, in more of a management role, so he was experienced but not current. So both seats were occupied by co-pilots, okay. <clears throat> and so this like young thirties uh, co-pilot, known as the company baby, he uh, gets into this thunderstorm. Uh, there's hail in there; it clogs up all three pitot tubes at once. No way for the Airbus. Very advanced system. Airbus, even up until last year, was marketing their system as pilots can't go outside of the envelope; like it'll prevent pilots from pushing it and exceeding their envelope. We should explain what the pitot tube is for people listening. Right, so pitot tube is how you measure airspeed. So it measures the uh, the, the compacting of the uh, the uh, wind against it versus the static port. And it's literally a tube, for, yeah. and that's why the hail could- Yeah, it, so it's, it's just a little tube, those measures openings, yeah. how fast you're going. And so Airbus had three of them on there. All three became uh, clogged up at the same time. Not a big deal. Plane's still flying, still generating lift. By every other indicator, you can look at it and tell that the plane's still flying. No issues. Yeah. Attitude indicator. Yeah. Good to go. Just cruising. In fact, this had happened 12 times in the past year. Also, the pitot heat, I have to assume, was going to be on at that point anyway, so it eventually would have corrected itself, given it enough time. Exactly. So that's that's what they figure if they... So if they had done nothing, it would have... It would have... Uh, they would have gone through the hailstorm. It would have melted the, the ice. They would have been... Fl they were flying. No big deal. And then they would have continued on the way. Like he the 12 started, times it had yeah. happened the previous year. But he probably was looking at a zero airspeed, wasn't he? Uh, or a rapidly yeah. decreasing airspeed? I think it might have been a really fast airspeed. So it was incorrect. Erroneous airspeed. either way. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> and so what he does is he, before he thinks, just pulls back on the stick. And that's the point of the book is you need to, to break down decisions and to assess, choose, execute. Yep. That's kind of what we were taught uh, in pilot training. Assess the problem first. He doesn't assess. He just moves right into uh, doing something. Pulls full back on the stick, rockets the plane up to like 30 degrees nose high. Um, that must have been fun in the back. Yeah, yeah, in the middle of the night. Holy shit. Stalls the airplane at like 38,000 feet. No big deal. 38,000 feet, easy to get out of that. Like You, you at least forward. have time. Plenty of time, power forward, no big deal. Yeah. Relax the stick. He keeps it stalled. Full Just ass full stick. back pressure. Um, you know, and the other co-pilot is trying to figure out what's going on, so he's heads down. So he's really close to figuring out a few times what's going on, but then he's, like, changing the radar screen, trying to go to the standby pitot tube, which is also clogged. By the way, the, the autopilot handed full control over the pilots at this point, so they're probably groggy, middle of the night, and then, oh, you know, shit, all the alarms go off. Yeah. Pull back on the stick, 38,000 feet, stalls, holds back on the stick. And this goes back to what we were talking about. They, you know, airline pilots, a lot of them just turn on autopilot, you know, 400 feet and then keep it there. Full back on the stick. They call the captain. Captain has time to run from his bunk up to the front and uh, full back on the stick. I mean, he's even more lost. Like, what's going on? He was yeah. sleeping. God, what a snapshot to be thrown into from a dead sleep. Holy yeah. shit. It's buffeting. Um, and he just holds, he just holds a stick back the entire time and just 
they just hit the ground. 50, so he stalled it right into the ground. Fifty-one. It's five minutes. Fifty-one g impact. Five minutes held back the stick. Um, at one point, he goes, "I've been holding the stick back the whole time." And the transcript is haunting because they're trying to figure out what's going on. Even at five thousand feet, they finally figure out what's going on because this guy says, "I've been holding the stick back the whole time." The Holy captain shit. and the other first officer is like, "No, no, no! Like, what have you been doing?" I have the aircraft. And so he pushes the stick forward. They can still save it. And inexplicably, the co-pilot pulls back on the stick. And then... Uh, so they had competing input? Competing input. And so, uh, you know, that's kind of like how a does that air, How does that aircraft prioritize that? That's a good question. That's interesting. I wonder what a fly-by-wire would do if it had competing input like that. There was a chime going off that there was competing inputs during it. But... Um, yeah, I guess it. I guess it went with him. Holy so, fuck! So, so yeah, ends up stalling it again, and then the you know other co-pilots like, I don't know what's going on. We're dead, and uh, the yes, captain's like, all right, just just pull up. And this is like one second before impact. Then, boom, fifty-one g impact broke up the whole plane. Yeah, but I mean that's, it's just such a, you know, like in the book I, I talk about like you don't want to necessarily, anytime somebody crashes and kills himself. There's a quote in there that basically you don't necessarily want to blame the pilot because, you know, every person that talked to them, every instructor that instructed them had a chance to to break this kill chain. And it's yeah. the same thing here. He either didn't get the proper training or, or something happened and he ended up stalling into the ground, killing all the people because he didn't assess the problem first. And so that was that was one of the stories that I have in the book. Um, I talk about uh, Eisenhower on D-Day moving back the uh, decision to uh, to launch because of the weather. And then there's a really risky three-day gap in the weather, and he chose to to go on there. Um, and then afterwards, he played board games afterwards, like making after making the biggest decision in history. Fuck. He was playing uh, shoots and ladders because he was just like, his brain was fried. There's nothing yeah. he could do uh, for the next, like, 24 hours. And so he was just trying to, like, recharge. And so, you know, I go through some of his thought processes of um, – you know, urgent versus important and yeah. uh, breaking that into quadrants. But uh, yeah, I wanted to be able to to really help people make better decisions in an engaging way. And I think that's one thing, you know, flying, as soon as you take off when you're solo, you're having to make decisions. It forces you to make decisions. Yeah. So I think um, you gotta, you know, that's you ultimately gotta, what we do. You got to take the time to analyze all the information coming to you. I had a time, I flew, it was early on when I was flying. I actually flew a Cessna out. I was augmenting a skydiving course out at, uh, there's a jumping facility south of Phoenix, north of Arizona. And I was like, fuck it. I got my license. I'm going to fly out there. I tied the, I think it was like a, I don't think it was a 152. It probably was like a 180 Cessna. <laughs> and tied the airplane down and I forgot to put the uh, pedo tube cover on. And there's a lot of dust out there. So I go to, to take off and I take off and the airspeed indicator starts giving me an erroneous airspeed. And I recognize what it was like halfway back to San Diego. But I also... You know, there's other information sources. Like there was a GPS on this one. I'm like, huh, here's a very good indication of my actual airspeed. Probably not great for my true airspeed, but I can, one, see that I'm moving, two, have some number to work with, and will base it off of feel when I go to, like, you know, there's, you don't have to freak out. Mm -hmm. And let, well, actually, freaking out is never going to help solve a problem, but like, there's other options. Right. You know, yeah. you could, I could have totally just stared at the analog airspeed indicator dropping off, be like, oh, I'm going to fall out of the sky. Or I could have looked at the fucking windshield or looked at the RPMs of the engine and be like, I'm totally fine. As long as you're <laughs> flying, you can always make totally. the problem worse. So just, well, so this this is a good story they have in there. So as soon as you get to F-16 uh, uh, B course, the instructors tell you anytime there's an EP, wind the clock. And so- you, have, you know, it's pretty advanced avionics in the F-16. Yeah. There's still an, a windable analog clock in the lower right-hand corner by your knee. Like, we never use it for anything. But they would say, wind the clock to give you, to break that habit, give you a couple seconds to, yeah. to, to before you do anything catastrophic that's going to change things. Just wind the clock, think about it for a second, and then start moving into what you're doing. So, yeah, so, yeah I, I talk about, you know, being able to assess the problem. And then I kind of get a little bit philosophical, I guess, in it because... You know, as fighter pilots, what we're what we are is we're wrapped in technology. We can fly a hundred times faster than we could by foot. We can carry a hundred times more. We can see a lot further. So we're using technology to augment our decisions that we're making. Same thing, I think that we are in everyday life. Like the average American, despite only burning ninety watts of electricity physically, 
we use about 12,000 watts of electricity uh, every day, through, and that powers the technology that mm -hmm. augments our decisions. So decisions have never been more important than they are now. I think Bloomberg just came out with uh, something saying they think that a billion dollar company is going to be run by three total people within the next decade because you can use like AI to automate a lot of things. So instead of like industrial revolution stuff where yeah. you have, you know, sweatshops with like thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people working, now use technology to automate a lot of things, which makes our decision making even more important than now. We're going to end up working for robots in like 10 years. <laughs> like yeah. I said, this yeah. literally this last weekend, I'm down with my wife teaching at a, a Glover Fieldcraft event. And I was, it was actually the YouTube question. I was, was curious about it because I was talking with the guy who runs his YouTube and he was kind of showing me behind the scenes and he goes, Hey, have you ever uh, played with chat GPT? I'm like, I've heard about it a bunch, but I actually have, I've never looked at it. So he pulls it up on his laptop. Five minutes later, I'm fucking downloading it for my own and creating my own account. The, it scares me. Again, I have a touch point of it of about like five entries into the thing, but the velocity that it's growing and how fast technology is evolving versus how slow human beings are evolving. I'm pretty sure we're about to live in the Terminator movie. Yeah. And I, mean, I don't know what I think about that. <laughs> there's, there's a good chance. I mean, just hop on board. I mean, I, you know, I figure it makes sense to learn chat GPT and that's what interests things. me. He was using it to, he was using it to not do work, to do research, mm -hmm. you know, um, and specifically talking about like uh, YouTube stuff, using that software to figure out, what give me compelling descriptions of this episode and the, one of the things i did like about and again super limited touch points on this but the chat gpt is you can ask it to refine it again and you can get a bunch of different mm -hmm. answers so it's not not that i would cut and paste on that but it's a creative uh avenue i'm not a very creative person when it comes to that stuff and the way he was showing where it'll research hashtags or it'll do bio research for you on a guest that you have he's like yeah it saves me like 10 hours a week like, yeah. Fuck. Why would you not use that tool? Exactly. I mean, I think that's that's leveraging what we can do. You don't yeah. need a team of five people to do that anymore. Do you even need like a Michael? You know, I'm thinking right now that his days are numbered. Here, yeah, we pretty, <laughs> should whisper about this, but yeah, um, I mean, I, not that it'll apply to anybody in this room. You but can like, auto switch now with the editing. Can like, you? It it will auto switch, so you don't need an editor anymore to do that for your podcast. It'll do that in like five seconds. I've known that since I first started working for you. He's you? just been keeping it secret. <laughs> I was like, son hmm, of a bitch. I probably shouldn't tell him about this one. <laughs> the next time we roll at jujitsu, I'm going to fuck you up. <laughs> that happens every time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to keep Michael around because we can't put that software into the centrifuge. <laughs> yeah. It's not going to be as entertaining. But yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I think it's just such an interesting space. I, I think for a long, long time, it's going to be uh, man plus machine yeah. beats either. And because everybody's always like, you know, aren't fighter jets going to be obsolete? Even, I mean, they're even like uh, billion dollar CEO, company CEOs that are saying bringing a man fighter to a autonomous battlefield in, in five years is going to be like bringing a knife to a gunfight. And that's that's just wrong. Um, because I agree. I mean, I don't have any data to support it but i feel like that's just wrong as well maybe in like 50 years or 100 years or something like that but i mean i think just humans we think uh critically we think creatively yeah so i think we can certainly be enhanced by these by these tools we can but also like the interaction with like so say there's a software that could pull up a youtube video and it could do the camera switching for us like you can't have a conversation with us like we're mm -hmm. talking about or kick around ideas or make fun of bottom bunk over there like yeah I'm getting no. you the fucking patch that's going to... You're going to have to wear a fighter jacket at all times now. Helmet's optional for now until I can find one that's uncomfortable for you. I'll get a patch made. Fuck yeah. Bottom, bottom Bo bunk? Bottom bunk. Okay. Yeah, that's where he belongs. That's where he lives. I'll, wear it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it. All right. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's interesting, interesting space, especially with, like, you know, combat aviation, like, being able to, you know, what are we going to do? Are we going to go out with autonomous drones? you know, with man fighters, um, cause they're gonna mm. have to make decisions on their own. So it's, it's a difficult, yeah. it's a difficult place. Are you going to continue to write? I don't know. This was, I put everything into this. This was, this was like a six year journey yeah. to be able to make this happen. Um, I, I love it. Uh, I love the writing process because it was so painful. Yeah. It was, it was, you know, four hours every day for 500 days. It's just super painful. But I think being able to learn how to be 
a pretty good writer is is valuable. So it might be like a, like a training camp thing where you know I just got done with a fight. I'll uh, you know kind of take take a, a break time from it. off. Yeah, and go then, fly uh, fishing or whatever. Yeah, floats your boat. Yeah, once I once I kind of get the bug again, because there's I think there's a lot of interesting things to say. I think writing is a really interesting interesting medium that that's going to be around for a long time. I mean, maybe I'll use ChatGPT to help me uh, organize the chapters or something like that. Michael and I were talking before you came in because I was telling him that I was fucking around with it. If I had had that tool when I was in high school, my GPA would be amazing yeah. and I would be even dumber than I am. <laughs> because all of my, first, instead of getting a, like a 1.8 GPA because of not doing anything, I would have had like a 1.0 GPA understanding with like a 4.0 GPA of work turned in, at least on my homework. I mean, that's, that's all that matters is, you know, do you really need to know about the Great Gatsby? Like, I don't know if I need to know about the Great Gatsby, but I mean, even from, again, I have, you know, I went through all the high school math. I've never used trick. Well, I probably have used essences of trigonometry and, you know, math and stuff every day. But like, you can ask complex mathematical questions and say, hey, give me a very detailed response of how you got here. So you could have 100% scores on stuff with absolutely no fucking understanding of what it is which I think we need to find a blend of those two things. There is some value to education. Yeah. You know, as opposed to educating yourself on the tool that allows you to get the grade so people leave you alone. And it's like... But I think you... Like, right now, all schools are, like, freaked out by it. They're banning all this stuff. (laughs) Good Um, luck with that shit. (laughs) But, I mean, that's like... uh, (laughs) Not being able to use a calculator. You know, at least my teachers would be like, you know, when are you going to have a calculator on you at all times? And it's like, well, every day, every day with the phone, every fucking day that has an app now that you can literally hold the camera up to a mm-hmm. math equation yeah. and largely do the same thing that chat T- GPT does. Just, That's pretty crazy. Yeah. right? What's it? Wolfram alpha or something like that. It, yeah, like, it solves not, it for you just and by shows you how camera. Yeah, it's insane. So, yeah. so I mean, I, I, I would never ban tools if I were like a school principal. Like, I think you have to be able to. I would embrace the tool, but also make sure that the underlying lesson still got across. Because having an understanding of the tool that can solve the problem, I think that's spectacular and that shouldn't be ignored. But there is a baseline level of problem solving that people should understand. Yeah. 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 I think it's learning how to think critically. Yeah. Like you have to maintain that lesson because what happens when you are separated from your tool for whatever reason, right? Anything with a battery, I hesitate to, uh, to, risk my life on that one thing, even mm-hmm. though, you know, shit, the stuff we had overseas, night vision goggles, all that stuff. To some degree, you could say, hey, you're relying upon this for your performance. And yes, I could, but I also understood the rote mechanics behind it that those things enhanced. And you have to have both. Totally agree. Like that's one of the chapters in the book I talk about is fast forecasting. I think a lot of people today, as we've specialized, are willing to hand over their critical thinking to committees or to computer models or chat yeah. GPT or Wolfram Alpha or whatever. I think you always have to be able to come up with a solution on your own. You have to, yeah. and and stake kind of your name on it. I think too too many people now are kind of afraid to do that, especially with like, you know, in the government with committees just bringing in lots of people. I think you have to say, I think this is how I'm going to predict. This is the decision we're going to make and go with it. And at the end of the day, it's I talk about it, like it's expected value. How good or something is it going to be? times the probability of that happening minus how bad it's going to be times the probability of that happening. And you should always be able to, for any decision, be able to come up with a rough basic solution before you start going to committees, computer programs, yeah. things like that, because it's, it's so easy to, for those programs for like, you know, one input to be off and for it to skew out just bullshit data. Yeah, for sure. How long are you going to stay in the reserves for? What are your plans there? I don't know. It just says as long don't as Don't tell I me like if you enjoy don't need doing to, it. Because the Air that? Force might be listening. They're like, oh, that motherfucker's getting out of here in two years. No, I mean <laughs> Your I'm flight uh, hours just all of a sudden auger in. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm I'm too uh, I'm too valuable for them right now. Because F thirty five, they're just building a crazy amount. So the yeah. pipeline is is instructors. So um I mean it's a good good position right now. Not many people are able to just be I didn't even know being a part time fighter pilot was a thing. So when I was growing up. Yeah. So it's pretty cool to be able to do that. It is a lot of work, even though I do only fly a couple times a month with all the currencies. So I'm just going to keep doing it until I don't enjoy doing it anymore. I, uh, you know, I only, I deployed with the F-16 in the combat, not the F-35. There's not a lot going on right now that the U S air force is involved in. So it would be, uh, cause I mean, that's at the end of the day, what you want to do as a fighter pilot, you yeah. want to go make an impact and that's the most meaningful stuff that I've done is working with those JTEX on the ground to, you know, you could hear it in their voice. They were stressed out. You'd be able to take out the threat 
And to this day, that's still the most meaningful thing that I've done in my career. So it would be nice to to be able to live that kind of again in the F-35, but I'm just going to keep keep enjoying it. I really don't have a good game plan for what I'm doing. I'm just kind of like hunting it. around, doing the YouTube thing, writing, flying. There's worse ways to spend your time. No, living the dream right now. If cash wasn't an issue and you wanted to commute with your own airplane, what would you fly around in? Uh, Limited to civilian options. You can't say F-22. Okay. <laughs> or F-35. You said cash wasn't an issue. So uh, it's true. Space shuttle. Well, um, that would be bitching, but I don't think they're going to sell you one. All right. Isn't uh, it a glider also? That'd be a tough one. You'd have to talk to Elon to get you up high enough. Yeah. Yeah. That's going to be pricey. Um, I would say there's this cool cool company that I've been working with a little bit called Black Shape. They make Italian uh, carbon fiber prop planes, and it's almost like a little miniature fighter. And so that's going through Get FAA. Get this approval. shit up on the screen right now, Michael. <laughs> it's been going right. through FAA approval for a couple of years, but uh, black ship, black shape, black shape. black shape. And so they want me to be a, a test pilot uh, in the U.S. for that aircraft. It's pretty cool. So, oh, interesting. This little one lightweight. Uh, it can pull six Gs. Is that a four seater? Two seater. Okay. Oh, so it's vertically stacked. Okay, as mm-hmm. opposed to side by side. Yeah, tandem. Okay. So, I mean, that's. That looks like a badass plane. That does look like a little fighter. Yeah. So, so what do we I got mean, there on the right wing on that thing? Is that a little radar bulb on the right or uh, no? What is that uh, thing? That might be where the gear comes in. Yeah. Okay. That does look interesting. See that on like the uh, Pilatus? I think it's on one of the wings. It's got. Uh, is it's it like, like a flare? It's a flare. Like I think it's their uh, weather radar, something like that. That's pretty cool. I'm not incredibly familiar with the Pilatus airframe. So this would be the plane. That I would fly. Um, what kind of uh, ground speed are you getting in that thing? I think right now it's like 160 knots, something like that. So it's not it's not insane, but it's pretty good. So much fun, though. They're trying to get through the FAA process. Like, it's been like a three-year thing for them. FAA is just so slow. So as soon as they get through with that, I think there's a lot of upgrades that are coming down. So that would be the plane. I look that at that and it's like, with. yeah, it might not get you there the fastest, but you'd have so much fucking fun on the yeah, way. Yeah, They're, it's getting <laughs> sorted for aerobatics. So it'd be that, or you know, if I had to go with like a more boring pick, but still badass, it'd be like an SR twenty two turbo. That's what I. So they ended up buying an SR twenty two turbo with the full FLIR under the left wing, like cell texting, like, and I flew that thing. I think I got fifteen hundred hours on that thing. It was oh nice. It didn't suck. I haven't even flown one. So you, how is it? Yeah, it's um, you are used to flying and not having a satellite control where so it's it's left hand control and very simple, you know throttle you would it's simple yeah and it was interesting because i went from you know flying the cessna with the traditional yoke i thought it was going to be really weird only having one hand on uh, like a very limit not it actually moves around quite a bit no issues whatsoever i actually found it to be quite intuitive and i'm yeah. right-handed and i thought that was going to be the issue because it was a left-handed yoke that'd be tough for me a lot of negative transfer for that yeah i could figure it out though like i think <clears throat> speaking of think that what is it, it and it obviously you didn't fly f-18s in Maverick, though, what's the little bottom piece that they were grabbing when they would always pull uh, full deflection to the rear? Does that allow them to exceed the G limit on the aircraft? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I think it does. Like we have like a you know because they always yeah. they would always show it actually when they would do the high speed pull out. They're like they would slap it with it and then I think it is because okay. the the F 18s is limited to I think seven and a half Gs. Okay, because those wings have to fold up. Same with the F five. Mav had to take it to ten though. I know. While I'm sure doing, was happy about yeah, that, while especially he's... in training. <laughs> So the thing is, if you ever over G the jet, you have to bring the, the crew chiefs uh, a case of beer. Because, I mean, those guys have to like, it depends how far you over G it. But yeah. Sometimes it needs like dozens of hours of maintenance and you're like, fuck. Especially with the F-35. Like when when I first came to the F-35, before we got a software update, it was limited to like seven Gs. And huh. the whole jet was designed to pull nine and you don't even have to think about it. So people were over Ging it left and right. And I suspect that if you do that, there's a record of it that can't be turned off until the mechanic goes in there and hits Especially the- with the asymmetric over G. Yeah. So I, I'm sure in the F-16, <laughs> we were asymmetrically over Gene that all the time. There's just no, it didn't, never showed you it. Yeah. The F-35, if you're flying the X, as we call it, versus the T, you know, staying on in plane. Yeah. It will, it'll pop and say you've over G and you're like, damn Son it. of a bitch. Yeah, yeah. I think you would actually probably enjoy one- I think they're up to like the G3000 suite now with like oh, everything is push button instead of rotary. And I don't, actually don't have any experience with that. It was a much more analog uh, panel, but 
Yeah, you, you'd be able to fly the shit out of that thing. I think with the SR22 you know, Turbo, it can actually start to make sense. I think every, yeah. like a Cessna or something, it's too slow and too they bulky. They have systems in these now where you, it's like if the pilot's incapacitated, it will fucking land itself. I've heard of that. That's insane. Yeah, like I'm, I think it actually it communicates probably via transponder code. It loads in, to, and again, I'm speaking out of my ass here, but this is just what I've kind of heard, but I think it'll load in an approach to the nearest... Uh, airport that's suitable for it and will actually put it on the ground. I think I've heard of that. Like, and they have to be real careful with the language because, yeah. you know, the le- legalities behind it. But that's insane that they can do that. For a commercial air, I mean, for a civilian aircraft, yeah, the parachute system on it is interesting as well. Uh, not that I would ever want to test it, but it is kind of cool to have that option, especially if you over a wooded area. Like, oh, let's just glide it into the treetops. I've seen videos. Yeah, like, I'd rather come in like this than like this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> or fix gear into water. No, thanks. I know how that works out every single time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it makes sense. Like if you're driving, I don't know, six, ten hours. Like, I oh, it 100% that, that makes, sense. makes sense at that point. It's just, I think the acquisition costs on these things are in the millions at this point, like low one point something. Relatively low, I think, operating costs, but it's it's you're gonna write you'll be writing a check. It's, you can't really make it make financial sense. Correct. Yeah, you really can't. What are you trying to pull up there, Michael? Uh, the parachute. Oh, the cap system. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty sweet. That is pretty cool. Yeah. Although I heard most deaths happen in the traffic pattern, where that probably won't help. I think. Well, yeah, because I think most deaths are uh, based to final turn stall, mm-hmm. and they go right in. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Same thing with that T thirty eight. Yep. We could do this video with Michael inside. God, he's so useful. That's why he'll never be replaced. I mean, Martin Baker invited me to do some <laughs> ejection seat trials. I don't think Fuck it involves that. me sitting in the seat, but I might try it. Yeah. That's I mean, that's one thing you don't want to do as a pilot is have to eject because that's like 20 plus Gs. Yeah. Most pilots are about two inches shorter after ejecting. I mean, this is wild. What a wild option. I mean, obviously it destroys the airframe, but you live. And that's why you also have insurance, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Friends and family. Yeah. They, yeah. they got to fly something like this. Well, and, and for people who don't know, if you have a fixed landing gear aircraft and you have an engine, this is a single engine. If you have something over water, you are going to fucking cartwheel. Mm-hmm. As soon as the landing gear makes contact, you're going ass over tea kettle versus this is going to bring you in vertically. Not that it's going to be uh, comfortable, but it's certainly more survivable. Yeah. Yeah, there's a strap. It's crazy. This so the strap system is all built underneath the uh, the fiberglass, and only upon the ejection does it actually uh, strip away like that. Yeah, that's such a cool system. I mean, yeah. that's kind of anytime I'm not flying an aircraft that doesn't have a backup system like that, yeah. I kind of feel weird because I mean, we always have the ejection seat. I wonder how hard this thing will hit. Looks like it's getting close enough to mess up the plane, dude. That's survivable every time. Yeah. That is survivable every time. That's really not that bad. Yeah. I'm not recommending anybody test it. I'm just saying it really doesn't look that bad. Wow. Yeah, that's impressive. Yeah. And again, imagine that at like you're flying cross country over a wooded train and mm-hmm. you lose an engine. Like I would I will take that over trying to f- well, land. I mean, yeah, same thing in the yeah. F sixteen, F thirty five. We're always training to glide it in to an airfield. But if yeah. we can't do that, we're gonna punch out. Yeah. And then it's going to glide itself in wherever it wants to. Yeah. I mean, you, you try to direct it somewhere somewhere else. But yeah. yeah. Yep. Cool. That's yeah, so crazy. You don't want to try to land it on a, a road or something like that. No. That's awesome. Where can people find you? I got to get you to the, uh, to the airport. Uh, every, you know, pretty much everywhere under uh, at Hazardly. So you can find me on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. Um, I have a website, hazardly.com giving away a flight in a uh, L39 uh, jet. So you can go on the website, hazardly.com slash book, and then you can uh, apply there um, just to kind of show, you know, what that decision-making is like in a uh, in a fighter aircraft. So, yep. yeah, just a uh, bunch of different places. And then the biggest one is the, uh, the book coming out May 23rd. May 23rd, and people will be able to find the book, I'm assuming Amazon or wherever they normally get their books? Yeah. Uh, Bar- Did you do an audio? I did the audiobook. Okay. So I did it and I read uh read parts of it from the cockpit of a non DOD aircraft. <laughs> That's I have to put awesome. that last part. Non DOD aircraft, but read parts of it from from the air. Um from Hell the yeah. cockpit. <clears throat> so pretty pretty unique uh thing and then also some some interviews, uh questions in there as well. But the book has been well received. It's been a priority book by Barnes and Noble as well as Meta, formerly Facebook. Yep. And it was selected as a must read by the next big idea club. 
and Malcolm Gladwell's on that board. So it's been well received. Uh, coming out May twenty third. You apparently got the copies before me, so uh, they have. I have two. Would you like to leave with a copy of your own book? No, you, you take it. I'm sure <laughs> some are on the way. I'm sure they got stuck somewhere. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see you know how this helps people. I think it has a, a good chance of helping people to make better decisions. Yeah. So just excited to see where it goes. I like things also that take the experience that you had, like I said, when it comes to, I think, the interest in the stuff you're talking about on YouTube. It's aviation, yes, but aviation to a degree that most people will never be able to touch. You're taking lessons from a world that people can hear about often, but I, what I think the most value, and I struggle with this too, like I really enjoy the experiences I had from my old job, but if I can't do anything with them beyond me, it's kind of like a dead end street, right? Like it was cool for me, but what's cooler than that is trying to figure out a way to take those experiences and help other people or bridge the gap for people who either have no desire to experience what we did or just ne will never be able to. But still have you know that touch point mm -hmm. and doing something with it, I think it makes it a much more enduring process as opposed to like, yeah, cool, it was great, lived a great life, see you guys later. Yeah, it's Deuces, meaningful. You know? <laughs> and there's just so much institutionalized knowledge out there. I. You know, I, I got that with the the Tool Guande's book. You know how much knowledge surgeons have, like fighter pilots yeah. have it, special forces, a lot of stuff uh, in there. So I think there's a lot of people that have a lot of institutionalized knowledge, and it doesn't get out a lot because yeah. people are busy. So, you know, I think it's it's really cool and interesting when people are able to to share those lessons. I agree, man. Well, I really appreciate you making the time to come up here from uh, Arizona, and I feel like we need to go dogfight each other. Let's do it. Let's. Have I. It. Hold on, though. You are a combat fighter pilot. I get to pick, like, several rules that stack the odds in my favor. All right. All right. You need to be in a Cessna. I'm <laughs> going to be in a turbine aircraft. I get real guns. You get fake ones. How about you start off <laughs> offensive? I'll start off defensive. I don't know what the fuck that means. So you start off behind me. And, but if we ever get That's out a of a situation. Advantage. But, okay, cool. But if it ever changes, we have to reset, and I get to go back there. If I'm able to shoot you. If you're ever able to not be in front of me, we immediately reset because it's broken the rules of the game. How am I going to shoot you? How am I going to win? You don't understand the game we're playing. Only no, I can the win. The game is I win? <laughs> <laughs> I, Let's set up. Cause, cause originally, I suspect it doesn't fucking matter where I start. I'm going to end up getting shot down. I don't know. I've never flown. I think these are extra 300. So I've never flown a prop plane like this outside the T6 okay. trying to dogfight. Neither so I think that's I. a huge advantage. I mean, neither have I, though. What we originally, what we were originally going to do, but I think this will be just as good, is taking a gamer because those DCS yeah. gamers, they're really good at flying in the yeah. digital world. Yes, but, they are. So I wanted to dogfight one of them in, in the digital world and then take them into the real world under G's and yeah. see how they do. Oh, I can tell you right now how they're going to do. It's called a degradation of skills. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when they puke all over the windscreen. Hundred percent. Like. It's like watching people who play Call of Duty and they jump into the middle of the room and they spin around real fast, but they actually shoot everybody directly in the face. It's like, yeah. okay, here's some wax bullets yeah. that I may or may not have put into the freezer. And by, the, <laughs> by that, I mean only I have those. <laughs> and maybe your gun's not even going to work. Let's go actually clear a structure and we're going to do it at night. And I'm the only one who has nods. Do your tactic. I'm going to fuck you up. Like, even, it doesn't work. the pain in, part will make a big 100%. difference. 100%. It, it completely and utterly changes it. And, and I'm not talking shit about uh, any of the digital stuff. I, I understand it's entertaining and awesome. Not everything in the digital world applies to the real world. Agreed. Yeah. The difference is you have you understand combat fighter tactics. I've watched Maverick. That's my dossier of combat fighter tactics. Well, you have like 3,000 hours of flying. That means I can probably safely take the plane off and get it back on the ground. It doesn't mean I know how to dogfight. Sounds like experienced pilot to me. <laughs> experienced pilot. You are an experienced combat aviator. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't, I'm not disagreeing <laughs> that I have an advantage. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. We should have a bet to this too. I don't know what the bet is, but we should have, we should establish the ground rules and then have some sort of Fuck bet. Because yes. that adds, that's really what you need for the YouTube videos. Yes. You need, you need that tension of uh, of something. There has to be some good or bad is going to happen. There's got to be some meat on the bone. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I'm so 100 percent down for that. I've okay. seen videos of that school and know exactly what you're talking about. Okay, but yeah, yeah let's let's uh, brainstorm. All right, I like it. And then uh, bottom bunk over there will somehow be involved, mostly from an entertainment perspective. From a you know painful uh, yeah whatever whatever's the, the the shitty job he'll be there doing a, a job that he fucking clearly knows AI already exists for but doesn't tell me oh, I <laughs> that's so funny <laughs> awesome just saving his job yeah thank you for the time all right cool thanks.